I think what I'll do is, Jerry, if you could introduce um, each of the persons from NMC who are planning to testify today, and then we'll ask Joanne to swear you all in as a group. Okay, good. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jerry Barbini, and I'm the interim CEO here at Northwestern Medical Center. And in addition to myself, you'll be hearing from uh, Don Bugby, our interim chief administrative officer, Robin Alvis, our chief financial officer, Stephanie Bro, our director of finance, Janet McCarthy, our board chair, Leon Berthium, our treasurer and immediate past board chair, Dr. Greg Brophy, our executive medical director, and Dina Orphanitis, our chief nursing officer. Great. So, Joanne, if you could swear them all in. Oh, I'm sorry, Kevin. I have one more. Devin oh. Bashelter, our, and I'm not sure your title, Devin, but <laughs> our budget manager, the brains okay, of the great. operation. <laughs> Sure, would everyone who's going to testify please raise their right hand. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. So Jerry, whenever you're ready to begin, take it away. All right, thank you. And good morning again, everyone, and thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. As I mentioned, um, I'm the interim CEO here at, uh, at Northwestern Medical Center. I've been here uh, since the end of March. And uh, as you know, there's uh, you know interviews uh, going on here. There's a transition in, in the CEO position and uh, interviews are going on. So I expect that I'll be here another, another month or two. Uh, as far as, as my personal background, I have, uh, I bring 40 years of hospital leadership experience with me here to this, uh, to this engagement. Uh, the last 27 years as a uh, hospital CEO in community hospitals in Massachusetts uh, and in Michigan. So I think I bring a unique uh, perspective our, to our discussion here today. I'm, I'm a fresh set of eyes. I'm brand new to the state of Vermont, brand new to St. Albans, and brand new to uh, Northwestern Medical Center. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, in the, uh, the few months that I've been here so far, uh, it's been a great experience. Uh, this is a great place. I'm, I'm sure most of you listening are uh, probably long-term Vermonters, so you know, you'll, you'll appreciate what I'm saying, but boy, this, this really is, is a great place. And uh, again, it's been a great experience. Didn't take me long uh, at NMC uh, to discover that this is an outstanding organization and an incredible community resource. You know, in the time that I've been here, uh, everywhere I turn, uh, I see quality. And as as in most high quality organizations, you know that that starts with starts with the people. And you know our constituent groups here, we have extremely strong commitment from all constituent groups. It starts with the board, it includes the providers, all of our employees, our patients, and the community. There's very strong community support for the hospital here. And all of that translates into very high quality care being provided to our patients. Uh, this organization lives the mission to provide exceptional health care for our community. However, uh, it also didn't take me long to determine that there are significant financial challenges here uh, in the organization. Four consecutive years of operating losses were in technical default on our bond covenants. And, you know, as a new person coming in, I asked the obvious questions, why? Now, now my experience most times when there are financial difficulties and operating losses. It's because of expense control. Expenses are out of control. Costs are too high. However, it didn't take long to determine that, that that's not the case here. Uh, and you're going to see some data later on in the presentation that, that will prove that. Uh, this is a low cost and a low charge provider. So that begs the question, what contributed to the financial decline? And I'll give you my opinion, the most significant factor is the compounding effect of the 8% rate decrease that took place in 2016. Prior to that, this was a financially 
strong organization with a consistent operating margin. And, you know, from what I can determine looking back, they got there one way, and that's sound, responsible management. And unfortunately, rather than being recognized and commended for that responsible management, they received the 8% decrease in, in 2016. So I wanna make a few comments about the budget itself before I turn this over. First, I think it's important to note that NMC has met all of your stated criteria for the fiscal year 21 budget submission. Now, in my 40 years of, of doing this kind of work, I've seen a lot of annual budgets, and I will tell you, this is an excellent budget. This budget represents a responsible balance of expense control, and you're gonna hear a little bit more about what we've done to control and reduce expenses later in the presentation. Also includes investment in services uh, to improve the hospital's financial sustainability and our ability to continue providing access to high quality care to this community. It's important that we not look at this budget in the context of one year. You need to look at it over a pattern of time, probably through a five year window. And this fiscal year 21 rate increase will help reverse the negative impact of the 2016 reduction. Since I've been uh, in the state of Vermont, I've heard a lot of talk about hospital sustainability, and I know you've got some, some work you're gonna be doing uh, here next year. And you know by then, um, I'll be long gone, but I will tell you that right now, today, uh, NMC is at a crossroad, and this budget will be a significant step in restoring NMC as a sustainable community hospital. I encourage you to approve uh, this budget as it is submitted. And, uh, and again, I, I thank you again for the opportunity to, to speak this morning. And now it's my pleasure to turn the presentation over to our interim chief administrative officer, Don Bugby. I don't know if we lost Don or what. Don, are you there? Yep. Hold on a minute. She's Can you back. Hear me now? <laughs> I'm back. Well, good morning. My name is Dawn Bugby. As Jerry said, I'm on a temporary basis as the chief, as the interim chief administrative officer. However, I'm not new to NMC. I spent 17 years here, um, with the last 10 of those being the chief financial officer. Most recently, I spent 13 years as the VP of Finance at Green Mountain Power. I feel so fortunate to have the opportunity to come back home, though. NMC is special. This community is special. It represents what Vermont is all about, caring for your neighbor. The temporary role was intended to help NMC achieve financial stability. But the day I walked in the door in March, COVID was just beginning to take its toll. You've heard the pandemic stories from all the previous presenters. However, Vermont is strong. Vermont is strong. We are all in this together. We are thankful for our strong leadership from the governor's office all the way down to our healthcare and essential workers working the front line. Many precious lives have changed forever. I, like so many others, lost a dear family member as he served as the community um, pharmacist. However, with this comes hope. This is a transformational moment in healthcare. We are now living in two parallel universes. For the near future, maintaining business as usual, but moving rapidly into the new norm. Finding the time to dedicate to prepare for the healthcare of the future. But to do all this, all hospitals are asking to first stabilize their current system so we can have the economic resources to invest in the future. With that, I wanna thank you Green Mountain Care Board and your staff for all the tremendous amount of time and effort you, you dedicate to this process and for taking your role very seriously. We do appreciate that. And with that, we always welcome the opportunity to tell our story in NMC. I'm transferring my speech then to Robin, who is our Chief Financial Officer. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Don. 
And thank you to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, for the record, my name is Robin Alvis. I'm the CFO for Northwestern Medical Center. I've been here right at a year. Um, and uh, what a year it has been. Um, you've heard over the last two weeks, um, all of our peers um, discussing uh, really what unprecedented times um, we found ourselves in and in, in taking care of our patients and responding to the pandemic. Um, those challenges, of course, aren't aren't unique to NMC, and and there's no um, no words that can do justice to um, the response of our uh, clinicians and the leadership of our physicians, and really the support of the entire community and our community partners um, to care for our patients and to keep them safe as possible and to keep each other very safe. However, most of our presentation today will be focused on the non-COVID impact and uh, where we were pre-COVID and what we need in a non-COVID environment to uh, regain financial sustainability. What you'll see is a budget that produces a net patient revenue decrease of about 1.4% year over year. You'll also um, hear about our um, exhaustive efforts to continue to, um, to control costs, uh, to make the necessary investments, but also to um, make the necessary reductions. Our expenses year to um, year over year are down about 100, uh, 1.5 million, and that includes absorbing about a million dollars in medical inflation. Our budget, as Jerry said, complies with um, the benchmark established under the GMCB Rule 3.202. To the left, we just went through the exercise to show under the budget order what we uh, could come and ask for. Uh, our adjusted budget to the left, you can see, was about $118 million. Um, our adjusted budget was 117. If you were to apply that 3.5% allowable growth, um, that would allow for an increase of 4.1 million in NPR and a total NPR cap of 121 million. Um, to ask for that, um, coming off of four years of, of not meeting um, our revenue cap uh, would have been irresponsible. And so as we looked at the our pricing, our costs, um, we're pleased to present a budget that comes in about one and a half percent less than our 2020 NPR cap, and it represents a variance from our allowed cap of 5.2 million. To the right, you can see the columns that show our adjusted fiscal year 2020 budget and the changes between that budget and what we're asking in fiscal year 2021. You can see our net ask is to provide a rate increase that will return us to a positive operating margin and to give us an operating margin percent of 2.3%, well below what the industry would uh, would recommend and say that our target should be. But we recognize that we're in, in unprecedented times. We recognize that um, there are financial decisions that have to be made um, uh, affecting all Vermonters and, and um, hospitals and, and our community are no different. <clears throat> Moving to our vision, we feel, as Jerry mentioned, our community support is tremendous and we belong in this community. We have many, many years of high quality service and engagement with our community. Our service area of Franklin and Grand Isle County um, gives us the privilege of, of meeting those community needs for over 56,000 Vermonters. While we're growing, one of the few areas of uh, the state that is, large portions of our service area are rural, and almost half of our patients uh, live north of us. And many would drive an hour or more for care at the next closest hospital if we weren't here to meet those needs. And that's on a sunny uh, Friday afternoon and not um, during the uh, the winter months where transportation is even more problematic. Also, it's our strong belief that community hospitals play a vital role in providing access to care in Vermont, even for those hospitals that are adjacent or in clo close, somewhat close proximity to a tertiary care center. As the designated sole community hospital, NMC brings value to our region. 
If we did not exist and care provided here had to go elsewhere, Vermonters would pay significantly more and have to travel farther. We feel it is important to have a strong relationship with our tertiary partner and our community partners. We feel the right solution is to continue partnership where it makes sense. And we're very proud to have helped support the dialysis center run by UVM that has been on our campus for more than 20 years. We also rely on our uh, partnership with UVM for specialty care uh, that we couldn't support independently in our community. Um, we've also had uh, uh, to make decisions where uh, statewide the scarcity of resources in certain specialties even make that um, relationship difficult to, to provide outside of Burlington. Which again brings me to the point and what uh, you'll hear us speak to over the coming slides is the vital importance of the community hospital to provide care for our patients close to home, close to their support network, and at a price point that makes sense, freeing up those valuable resources and services that really only our tertiary partner uh, can provide and who is trying to meet the needs for the entire state of Vermont. I'm going to ask Stephanie Bro, our Director of Finance, to lead us through some of our uh, financial and supporting data. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Robin. Um, for the official record, my name is Stephanie Bro, uh, and I'm going to keep us moving along here for a little bit. You asked us to provide a summary of our net patient revenue and a summary of our budget request. And so you can see that here. Um, as you've already heard, this budget represents a decrease in our net patient revenue from the current year budget. And that decrease is approximately 1.4%. Um, and it leaves about $5.2 million in allowable net patient revenue growth on the table but we felt that that was really important um, not to just try to maximize our cap space, even though that cap space is precious. Um, we really wanted to build this budget from the ground up and looked at uh, actual data from October through February in order to do that, which is not unlike you know, our regular process anyway, so COVID was not horribly disruptive to that. Um, most of our volumes are assumed to be flat. Um, there are some that are decreasing slightly just based on trends that we see. Um, and there are some uh, changes related to programs and services that I'm gonna talk about in a few slides. I've heard uh, some of you ask about assumptions related to reimbursement from payers. And so I thought this might be a good place to talk about that. Uh, we have assumed no increase or decrease from Medicaid, and we have assumed a small increase from Medicare, just based on the proposed rule that was available to us at the time. We did not include a three-month uh, reprieve from sequestration, um, which for NMC would be worth approximately $75,000. So we want to calculate that for you and be transparent. Um, but you'll see as we go through the rest of the presentation that we have uh, unfavorable offsets to our budget as well that relate to information that we've received since submitting and that there are several areas of risk uh, for NMC in this budget. Our plan uh, moving off to the right of this slide is to implement a 25.37% increase on hospital based services and a 0% increase on physician professional services. And that's been our strategy uh, for a few years now. And I want to explain the reason why. Um, we feel really strongly that a 0% increase on the physician professional services is the best way to meet the need of our community. Um, because someone with a high deductible plan, which so many people have that these days, or someone who doesn't have insurance at all, we want to make sure that those people can still make a trip to their primary care physician and to do it in an affordable way. So we haven't touched those rates in quite a while. This is a summary of our P&L and our balance sheet. 
Um, as mentioned earlier, also this budget generates net income from operations of 2.8 million uh, or 2.3% operating margin. We have also included some non-operating income here, which is mainly interest and dividends from our investment portfolio. I thought uh, this might be a good place to answer another question that I've been hearing, uh, which is around inflation assumptions. So we have assumed a 2% uh, increase in wages for all staff. We have assumed 3.8% inflation on pharmaceuticals. 5.7% inflation specifically on surgical implants and 2% inflation on all other supplies and services. And so what uh, we did was put that all together uh, for you in a weighted average and the weighted average is 2.25% uh, which for NMC equates to right around $1 million. We are projecting a current year loss from operations of approximately 4 million, and it will be the fourth consecutive year that NNC has experienced an operating loss. And those operating losses total $18 million and are not attributed to COVID. NMC has had to subsidize uh, some of these losses with drawdowns from its investment portfolio. And, you know, it's always our hope and our plan to use that investments portfolio to pay for capital investments and to have that uh, money available to us to make it through tough situations that we can't anticipate, such as COVID. NMC has been fortunate enough to receive over $12 million in stimulus funds and over $5 million in advance payments from payers uh, that will need to be repaid. And we have submitted an application uh, to the state for the health care stabilization grant. Um, but as you've heard already, um, we're unsure if anything will be received. Um, that grant does not provide you with an ask or a dollar amount when you submit it. Uh, and yesterday we submitted our FEMA application as well. And I expect to receive around $100,000 um, related to that FEMA application. We have applied for hazard pay um, for certain of our employees that qualify, and we have also applied for smaller grants um, through VAS or through the Emergency Preparedness Coalition. So we've really tried to take advantage of everything that we can, um, everything that's appropriate, and we will continue to do that. But we know that our investment portfolio was needed early on, right, before help arrived and before the stimulus money arrived, and we know that it may be needed again. Moving over to the balance sheet uh, on the right hand side of this slide, I want to focus on the ACO reserve of 1.6 million. Since putting this budget together, we received communication that our risk reserve liability will actually be $2 million. So that is an unfavorable offset for us of 400,000. I do want to spend a couple of minutes going through ACO risk reserve activity. Um, because as you all know, it's multi-year and it's complicated. Um, so I thought it might be worth the exercise. Uh, as of today, NMC has just shy of $3 million of ACO risk reserve on its balance sheet. NMC will be writing a check for over $1.5 million uh, to the ACO for the 2019 program year, which is the calendar year. So that will leave us with about one and a half million of risk reserve. But NMC's total risk for the 2020 program year, the year we're in right now, is 2.2 million. So NMC will have to work with its auditors to determine if an additional 700,000 is needed in the current year to cover that risk. And if so, it represents an unbudgeted amount for NMC and it will have a direct impact on our bottom line. We're gonna talk more about ACO participation and how it relates uh, to our rate increase request for today in just a few slides, but I wanted to provide you with that background. This is a look at our 2021 cash flow statement. 
The budget we have put together generates negative cash flow of 5.6 million, but that is because of the maximum potential, and I, I really want to emphasize the word potential, uh, capital spend that you see there of 14.75 million. We have put the maximum in here, but there is no doubt whatsoever um, that we will have to be flexible with our capital spend because it's something that, you know, organizations can quote unquote, you know, control pretty easily. And deferring capital investments, especially for multiple years in a row, it has consequences. It's not something any organization wants to do, but it can provide short term benefit. And so it will be up to us to find the right balance and to use that capital money wisely. NMC does currently have an approved uh, certificate of need for an emergency department renovation. And that represents 7 million of the 14.75 that you see here. And that 7 million would be funded with previously designated assets from our investment portfolio, not through rate increase. As I mentioned earlier, we do have some service line adjustments that have been incorporated into this budget. And we have spent a lot of time uh, in the current year looking at service lines. And when we look at them and when we have those conversations, we've really been putting them into three buckets. What do we want to invest in? What do we want to see if we can restructure or do it differently? What might need to be transitioned or even divested in? So what you see here is that we are continuing to invest in primary care and pediatrics. We have new providers coming. Uh, two new primary care providers will be joining us this fall, as well as a pediatric APP. And we're recruiting for two more pediatric providers. We really feel that continuing to invest in primary care is crucial to population health um, and the triple aim. And not only investing in it, but really doing that work in accordance with patient-centered medical home team-based care standards. We're strengthening our ICU program and adding tele-ICU through Dartmouth. And that's another example of NMC using partnership when appropriate to improve an existing and a needed service. And this partnership will allow us to keep appropriate ICU level patients in our community. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a couple of slides. We're also planning to provide sleep services within our existing pulmonology program to address a community need. And we also see uh, sleep services as a primary care type of investment. Uh, as patients with untreated sleep apnea or other sleep disorders often develop additional chronic diseases. Moving into the category of restructured, you see that we continue to provide lifestyle medicine and Rise Vermont services. We have further integrated uh, lifestyle medicine into primary care. And we now see ourselves as a Rise Vermont spoke with the ACO acting as the Rise Vermont hub. It's been exciting for us to start that program and to see that transition. And lastly, we're proud that we have worked with our community partner to maintain addiction and mental health services for our community. And we have transitioned outpatient neurology services back to UVM Medical Center where that care is most appropriate at this time. So now we're moving into the risks and opportunities section of our presentation, uh, and you'll, you'll find out that we feel that there are many. First and foremost, we want to revisit our mid-year rate increase request and the additional work that we have done since then to address your concerns. As you know, we experienced a major impact of volumes in our physician practices after implementing a new electronic medical record in May of 2019. We estimated that impact to be worth approximately $7 million in the current year. And the feedback we received was to cut expenses accordingly and to cover temporary losses with days cash on hand. And NMC has done that. We have done the hard work of cutting expenses, $1.8 million within the physician services division alone, 
uh, across 11 practices. And Robin's going to talk more about expense reductions elsewhere in a few slides. We have funded the temporary losses with days cash on hand, and we have continued to optimize the system. We have worked tirelessly with the vendor, with our staff, with our providers, and we have reduced the impact by about $2 million, and our current volumes are within MGMA standards. But we're challenging ourselves to continue optimization and to cover another 1.7 million in 2021. And so this is a risk area in our budget, and we think that the continued use of telemedicine is going to be crucial to mitigating that risk. Like many of our peers, uh, we began to use telemedicine heavily at the onset of COVID. And it's really been a bright spot of the pandemic for us. Many of our patients have really embraced it. So between the expense reductions, the ground that we've already made up, and the ground that we are still challenging ourselves to make up, we have come up with uh, five and a half million of the original $7 million ask, if you will. Unfortunately, there is still an impact and we can't implement further cuts in this area without jeopardizing quality care. I agree with anyone that there's always room for improvement and there's always opportunity to reduce expenses. And so we're certainly going to keep at it. Uh, but it would not be prudent to build additional expense cuts or additional volumes into our budget at this time. The other item that we discussed with you during our mid-year rate increase request was around temporary staffing and our ICU. Workforce recruitment and retention continues to be a challenge and we continue to need travelers. I've had the opportunity to listen to the other budget presentations and I'm really impressed and, you know, quite frankly, I'm jealous um, that some of the other organizations have been able to reduce or altogether eliminate their use of travelers. And so we're certainly going to be reaching out to them to make sure that we aren't missing something. But like our peers, um, we have worked hard to revamp our orientation and our training programs. We have provided tuition reimbursement to try and grow our own, and we continue to work on longer term solutions, such as our partnership with Vermont Technical College. I've touched on that program in the past, but I want to remind you of how it works. It's called the Aspire program. We provide space, we provide tuition, and we provide guaranteed placement of up to 10 graduating nurses. This fall will be the first class of students for that program, which has been nearly two years in the making. So we're excited um, about the potential uh, future benefit that that program can provide. The feedback that we received following the mid-year rate increase regarding our higher than budgeted traveler costs was to provide some detailed information about ICU services and whether the neighboring tertiary care facility had the capacity to more effectively treat those patients. It is important to note that not all of our traveler costs come from the ICU, so that may have been a point of confusion when we did the mid-year, um, but we certainly utilize travelers in the ICU, and so we wanted to address your concerns. The tele-ICU addition results in 130 fewer patient transfers per year. Uh, UVM provided testimony during their budget presentation that they are at or near capacity. And so we truly feel like keeping lower level acuity ICU patients here within the community is actually a way for community hospitals to support tertiary care providers and really ensure that Vermonters with high acuity cases have a bed and have um, the opportunity to receive the care that they need. Also, the tele-ICU program provides a positive contribution margin for NMC because we receive sole community hospital reimbursement. We're designated as a sole community hospital through Medicare, and we receive low volume payments from Medicare. And that program, the payer mix for that program is highly Medicare. So we really see this as a win-win. Um, with all of that said, NMC has significantly reduced its 2021 traveler budget from what our current year projected spend is. 
And so once again, we're pushing ourselves, we're challenging ourselves um, to do better in this area and we're taking on risk in this budget. The largest risk and the largest opportunity for NMC relates to its pricing. And so I'm going to spend a fair amount of time going through it, if you can all bear with me. Um, before we dive into the data related to pricing, we want to address some important issues. And the first of which is affordability. Implementing rate increases impacts our community. There's no doubt about that. Uh, it impacts the families that live here and that receive their care here. And we do not take any rate increase lightly. Um, that is shown in our history. We fully understand that this is difficult and we still believe that the only thing more difficult would be if NMC does not exist to serve the community for years to come. This rate increase is needed for long-term sustainability and it makes sense within Vermont's overall system. And the next important issue I want to talk about is the cost shift. The cost shift is real and the cost shift is concerning. Nearly every hospital has uh, had the chance to speak with you all about the cost shift and the fact that solving it, you know, requires solving some fundamental issues at the root of our healthcare system. Um, what we're trying to say here on this slide is that this budget does not represent a cost shift for 2021 due to the fact that we are seeking a decrease in our net patient revenue and that the commercial payers have benefited by NMC not hitting its net patient revenue in the current year and quite frankly for the last several years in a row. And then lastly on this slide is the important issue of continuing to provide charity care to the individuals that need it. We had the opportunity to collaborate with the healthcare advocate this past fall and to expand our charity care eligibility. We increased the income level, we removed residency restrictions, and we simplified both the policy and the plain language summary. And so I want to uh, give a shout out and really thank them for their hard work and their collaboration with us on that project. Uh, also, when talking about pricing, it's important to remind folks that hospitals are not receiving the full contracted rate from commercial payers. So bad debts and denials uh, from within the subscriber base can result in, or doesn't can, it does result in decreased uh, reimbursement from the contracted amount. And you've already heard testimony that denials are up, uh, especially supply-related denials and that has been our experience as well. Differences in payer mix must also be considered. Uh, NMC has one of the, if not the highest Medicaid payer mix of any Vermont hospital. It creates a financial challenge for us, that's true, but it remains our privilege to serve this population in the same way that we serve the whole. And we need to talk about the impact of social admissions. Dementia patients and psychiatric patients, they limit every hospital's ability to maximize revenue and to operate at the utmost efficiency. Keeping these patients safe until we have an appropriate place to discharge them is absolutely the right thing to do. It's at the core of our mission. It's what we all do. But we often cannot get paid for subacute patients and they can stay for weeks or months at a time. Fiscal year to date through July, NMC's subacute patient days are up 26% compared to the prior year. And again, this is not an issue unique to NMC. Um, it's a day-to-day -day balancing act for all. Uh, now for some data to support our rate increase request and really to demonstrate the impact that, that it would have if implemented. So this first graph you see here, this is an exploratory analysis only, okay? It cannot be used uh, to draw conclusions on its own and we absolutely recognize that. Um, once again, I wanna give kudos to the healthcare advocate because they reached out to us and we've had the opportunity um, to take some good time to go through it with them and we're really grateful for them to take the time to do that with us. 
what we did here, just to try and walk you through it, what we did was we created two models. One model for net patient revenue and one model for hospital expenses. And we used year to date volume statistics through February for each hospital to predict the levels of revenue and the levels of, of expense that you would expect to see given those volumes. Then we compared the actual revenue and the actual expense to the predicted revenue and the predicted expense. And we created the four quadrants that you see here. Points further to the left of this graph have actual revenue less than what was predicted and points toward the bottom of this graph have actual expenses less than what was predicted. And as you can see, NMC falls in the lower left quadrant, indicating that both revenue and expenses are less than what the model would have predicted. And again, it's just a small piece of our presentation and we, as we try to look at pricing and parity in a variety of different ways. Um, another way that you could look at it, a uh, statistic that I think is much more familiar to all of us would be a cost per adjusted patient day statistic. So we looked at that as well, um, and we feel we can fair, compare favorably there too. Uh, this next graph is a graph you've seen before. Uh, we included it in our budget presentation last year, and it shows the history of rate increases and where NMC falls within the range, so that would be the gray shaded area, and where NMC falls against the median for any given year. You can see that NMC is often below the peer group, and if granted the rate increase that we have asked for, NMC will still be below average over a span of 11 years. NMC would be at 3.9%, with an average of 4.5%. And you can also see when you look at the last 10 years of actual data, 2011 through 2020, NMC has been the lowest rate increase 50% of the time. And we're only one out of 14 hospitals. You've heard us and others uh, speak about the compounding impact of rate decreases. Uh, Jerry spoke about it uh, at the beginning of our presentation. And so we wanted to expand on that and turn it into dollars and cents. As some of you may recall, NMC exceeded its net patient revenue budget by $2.9 million from 2014 through 2016 and reduced rates by 8% in 2016 as a correction. The correction equated to $4.2 million per year at the time and continues to compound. So nearly half of today's rate increase request is to close the gap that you see here to undo the compounding impact, which we feel was never the original intent. And then this graph and the next two graphs that follow are to illustrate that NMC will remain a very cost-effective option for Vermonters if the rate increase that we have requested is granted. We gathered uh, data from the publicly available hospital report cards to obtain uh, detailed pricing information. And then we looked at just the basket of services that NMC offers and we applied the prices to each organization on just that basket of services so that we would have a true comparison and so that we could demonstrate and see for ourselves that if we implemented this rate increase, would we still be cost effective? And we understand that every organization has its own financial goals and its own unique challenges. This first graph focuses on inpatient stays. So the green bar that you see it represents $1 of an inpatient stay today at NMC. And if granted the rate increase, it would be $1.25. And you can see that it puts us much closer in line with some of our peers, but still below average. Same idea here. Uh, this graph represents outpatient CPT codes. 
so lab tests or diagnostic imaging procedures, for example. And you can see that if granted the rate increase, our pricing will remain below average, but more in line with our peers. And then lastly, this graph represents outpatient procedures, so that might be a colonoscopy, for example. And you can see that if granted the rate increase, our pricing will still be well below average in this case, but closer to our peers. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Robin. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, continuing the theme of risks and opportunities, um, we have to talk about the ACO. Um, and our view is that it's both a risk and a tremendous opportunity. Um, speaking from a personal professional standpoint, I'm a 30 year veteran um, in healthcare, and I know that um, our payment system needs to be reformed and that incentives have to be aligned uh, with quality and appropriate utilization and uh, improving population health. It's what drew me to Vermont, it's what drew me to NMC in particular. What I've learned over um, the last year is that um, it costs a tremendous amount of money to participate and help support health care reform in the state of Vermont. For NMC, that participation, and Stephanie um, uh, detailed that earlier, uh, represents 7.25 percentage points of our overall ask. It relates to dues of uh, almost a million, um, the risk reserve funding that, that we originally projected at 1.6 that we now know is 2 million. And um, because of lack of scale represents a loss uh, in our fixed, when we compare our fixed pr prospective payments to what we would have received under fee for service. Attribution remains far below the level that we need to offset the decline in utilization in a fee for service model. The healthcare stabilization grant um, does not seem to yield a significant award that would help offset the risk of the ACO based on our understanding at this point in time. Regarding healthcare reform, we have been a leader from day one as an organization. We have been all in from the very beginning and with all payers. Uh, we are struggling to continue to afford that investment and our board um, is constantly reviewing and asking and evaluating the value proposition of healthcare reform, reform relative to the investment that NMC continues to make. One Care has done a lot of work to reduce the due structure and to reduce the maximum risk in 2021, and we thank them for those efforts. But as you saw in their budget presentation, some of the cuts that they had to make were in key program areas that are critical to improving population health. However, we cannot afford to face the risks of COVID and the ACO um, and still be responsible in our rate request if we don't include it. Bottom line, any attempt at, at health care reform without scale will fail. Attribution continues to remain our biggest um, risk and concern. It's also important to know that at our current level of attribution of around 35%, um, we still have 65 to 70% of our patient population that receives the same focus and attention to improving uh, the health in our community. NMC is the largest private employer in this community. For us to be successful, we need to have a healthy workforce and they need to have healthy families. So we remain committed to the idea of health care reform, but we are struggling to find a way to continue to bear the risk. And at the current level of attribution, we think all hospitals are being asked to bear that risk disproportionately. The next two slides attempt to illustrate um, simply <laughs> um, a very complex issue, and that is around scale. At this point in the program, um, the original projections is that we would be in the area of attribution where the green line is. And that also for NMC happens to be the level of attribution at about 55% that we need to thoroughly align population health investments, primary care health investments, um, and reduce the focus and the dependence on fee for service. So you can see that when you look at the um, far right column, as attribution increases, 
our lost revenue associated with a typical fee for service declines. And that is the total aim of an all payer model and capitation as a whole is to provide a consistent revenue stream that hospitals and providers can plan their care around and can focus on investing in longer term strategies that will continue to reduce utilization and ultimate health care costs. At 30% attribution, we are not there to scale and we don't see a path forward to reaching it in the near future. The next slide shows um, the importance of attribution in a different way. And what this represents is in general our 15 major service lines. And at the lower end of uh, the scale, you can see these numbers of service lines. And what this represents, and you've heard other hospitals talk about contribution margin of various service lines, that we have some that help support critical needs of our community that can't support itself financially. At lower levels, we struggle to reach that balance of fixed payments relative to what we would lose in a fee-for-service world. As you progress to the right of the graph, that correlates with attribution. And you can see that we begin to reach that tipping point of around 50 to 60% where we have enough fixed payments to allow us to invest and consider the longer term strategies and not be so reliant in the acute impact in any given year of still having the majority of your um, patient population in a fee for service model. We'll turn our attention now to, I think, the biggest risk for, for everyone, and that is, you know, what will COVID look like this fall? Um, nobody knows that. Uh, we, we talked at length and, and we're thankful to have the opportunity to, um, to, to speak with the Green Mountain Care Board about what should our budget um, guidance be in uh, 2021 relative to COVID. What you can see here is literally anyone can show a projection that can't be attacked, nor can it be defended. What we tried to show were some scenarios that were based on what our lived experience has been over the past few months. You can see that first row is what a, our COVID-19 free budget looks like. In a perfect world with the work that we've done around controlling our expenses, um, setting an appropriate pricing, um, and would return us to a positive operating margin of 2.8 million. Scenario A would assume what was our lived experience when we were in phase one and if phase one constituted three months of the year and phase two for nine months at the year of the year that would have generated for for NMC a loss of $30 million. However, um, in testament to the leadership really of Vermonters, um, the state leadership, our clinical leadership, and, and really just the compliance and care of, of Vermonters for each other. Um, we really think that that A is, is a worst case scenario that likely is, is not to happen based on um, us being ahead of schedule, I think, and, and close to phase three in terms of our um, capacity and productivity. Uh, scenario B shows what it would look like if um, our first full month of recovery, which was June this year, would be our revenue level for an entire year. Um, that would have generated under that scenario a loss of $18 million. And that is what we would be looking at had we not had um, uh, the help from the stimulus money. Uh, COVID C to, to us represents something that's a little more realistic as we've continued since the time that we submitted the budget to see the impact on our revenue and recovery of operations in July and through the first part of August. Um, we think that um, for NMC, we could probably most realistically expect about a 10% ongoing uh, decrease um, related to the COVID-19 impact. And then um, scenario D would be if, if Vermont was in a phase one for six months and then phase two for six months. So again, as you can see, there's a wide 
possible um, uh, outcomes that could be considered and and none of us have that crystal ball. So what we chose to focus on really uh, was what we know, and that is the impact on our expenses from COVID. And we continue to learn more every day. As more about the disease uh, and, and effective treatments are known, we'll continue to see an impact on our cost. Um, the highlighted column here um, builds upon uh, the column A, which is the COVID free budget. Uh, the Green Mountain Care Board asked us to give a COVID budget, and that's what we've done and illustrated here in column B. But because of really the impossibility of, of predicting what future volume would be, we uh, chose to focus on the expenses and knowing that that is a given. COVID has forever changed how we deliver health care, and we have, quite honestly, have challenges with our smaller footprint, with our antiquated ED that has curtains for walls instead of plaster and, and limited ability uh, to minimize um, uh, cross-contamination of patients through an aer aerosol aerosolized um, uh, virus such as COVID. As you can see, we anticipate based on what we know now with the demands for curbside testing, for the cost of testing agents, for PPE, which you've heard from others that the costs are skyrocketing um, when those supplies are, are, are even available. Um, for us, we expect over an annual basis that we're going to need an, uh, another 18 employees just to support the safe delivery of care and the testing required um, and is necessary for not only treatment of COVID patients, but also uh, part of the recovery uh, process as we look to, re to return um, patients to the hospital and the return of elective yet needed um, procedures. Um, continuing on risk and opportunities, I mean, financial sustainability, it's, it's a risk, the struggles you've heard about um, the pricing and the compounding impact uh, on our top line revenue. And you've also heard about some of our um, cost reduction strategies. I agree completely that um, any organization should always challenge themselves. Is there um, a better way to provide care that is more financially sustainable? And we've done the hard work pre-COVID as well as throughout COVID to continue to make those changes. We spoke to you about our service line adjustments that we felt were, were appropriate at this point in time and where we had partners who could provide um, that service uh, to our community. We looked at our campus operations and utilization of our facilities to close some sites that were external to our main campus and that resulted in um, fewer lease expenses. We also looked at uh, opportunities and worked with our benefit advisor to see how we could restructure our employee benefit program to reap some savings yet still have a benefit program um, that is crucial and competitive to our recruitment and retention. We also um, put our uh, we're self insured insurance plan. We put our third party contract to bid and we were able uh, to uh, reap through a new vendor uh, reduction in fees. The most painful uh, decision that we had to make had to do with our staff. NMC has been here in the community um, for decades and on multi-generational um, employees. We have mothers and daughters that work here. We have sisters and cousins. We're a small community. NMC is the biggest private employer. To ask our employees to basically fall on the sword during a time of unprecedented loss of revenue, four years of sustained losses, opening up a, a voluntary exit plan that ultimately, while we appreciated that commitment from those employees, many of which who had been here 30 and 40 years and still have so much to give um, to our organization and our community, it wasn't enough. We had to follow our voluntary reduction in staff with an involuntary reduction in force that built upon um, the cost containment strategies that we had around furloughing employees. 
during the height of COVID as we had to limit our footprint and had to limit our um, uh, the limitations of our physical plant, we did furlough employees. Some employees had to self furlough because of uh, child care. What we found is that um, with the expansion, while we appreciated and we reaped some savings in our salaries and wages, we're self-insured from an unemployment compensation standpoint. And with the expansion, much needed expansion of an unemployment benefits, um, what we didn't pay in salary, we were, were often paying in unemployment compensation. We also did have some areas where we uh, could implement um, a, a better process or a different tool that reaped some efficiencies and would lead to some per, um, permanent reductions in staff, and we made those decisions. Again, some of those decisions impacted very long-term, very loyal um, members of our community, and um, this organization felt it in the midst of, of really trying to stay safe, trying to care for our patients in an unprecedented time of health emergency. Um, we, were, we were also feeling the economic fallout and grief of losing members of the NMC family. And that's what this organization and this community is. Every community hospital is so vital to their community from an economic standpoint and from a quality of care and an access to care. All of that activity over the past year pre-COVID, some of which included um, the reduction of, we eliminated raises for leadership and managers, preserving that for, um, for our frontline employees. But the culminating impact of that is that we were able to reduce our expenses by over $4 million, and we responsibly uh, were able to contribute um, expected increase in revenue of $750,000 going forward. Our most concerning and my most concerning risk has to do with noncompliance of our bond covenant. We've been out of compliance for over a year. We have been in close communication um, weekly, if not sometimes daily, depending on the performance of the stock market um, with our uh, bank and bond managers. Um, during, since the time that we submitted our budget and uh, today, um, the bank asked to have a meeting with me, with Stephanie, with Jerry and Dawn to talk about what was our plan um, in the next year to um, to rectify this deficiency and to come into compliance. Of course, they understand the regulatory environment that we have in Vermont around our pricing. They are aware that we are meeting with you today. They're aware of what our ask is of you today. And they agreed to um, extend the timeline in which we have to provide them with the action plan um, to uh, allow us 30 days post um, the rate decision um, that you will ultimately make for NMC. If the issue of our bonds uses to call it, if we can't present a plan that gets us into compliance, um, that would have an immediate impact on our day's cash on hand, uh, reducing it almost in half or, or 100 days. Um, an opportunity uh, that, that we are proud to continue to invest in, and as I mentioned earlier, um, we are nothing without our employees, and uh, we need them to be healthy, and our employees can't really provide the care and the quality care uh, to our patients if their families aren't healthy. So we continue to make investments in patient-centered medical home, North, uh, Northwestern Primary Care and Northwestern Georgia Health Center had already received the highest level of um, certification as a patient-centered medical home. This past year, due to the tremendous engagement and leadership of our pediatricians, we're pleased to announce that Northwestern Pediatrics is also certified as a patient-centered medical home. The amount of effort required to satisfy those requirements um, to build upon uh, and, and in alignment with the ACO, a focus on care management um, was a tremendous ask of our providers at a time that we were also implementing and working through new workflows with our EHR. 
Um, we're very proud of the efforts um, around quality preventative care and um, have to definitely recognize Northwestern Georgia Health Center um, for having received the Vermont Department of Health um, as gold status for childhood vaccination levels. We continue to be actively engaged in the Blueprint for Health. Uh, NMC has been a driving uh, local force in the Blueprint. Uh, we are the fiduciary uh, uh, agent for the state um, for our health service area. We continue to partner with um, uh, our community partners to improve um, both uh, problems with uh, chronic pain and with asthma COPD. As Stephanie um, spoke earlier, we continue to invest in RISE Vermont, but, but at an appropriate level, respective of, um, uh, of a community hospital. And then finally, we continue to be engaged along with Northwestern Counseling uh, as co-leaders of our Regional Clinical Performance Council. Finally, just a quick recap on our capital budget plans. This gives you a little more detail uh, under what our expected investment would be should our finances allow. Um, most critically, we will uh, move forward and are appreciative of the approval of our emergency department CON. And before we bring the presentation to a close, again, I want to thank you. I want to remind you that we have met the stated criteria for our budget. We have uh, made difficult decisions and we continue to challenge ourselves in the area of cost containment. We are requesting a rate increase that allows us to achieve parity and pricing with our peers and still provide um, a low cost altern alternative for our Franklin and Grand Isle residents. At this point in time, before um, we entertain questions, I would like um, to uh, allow our current board chair, Janet McCarthy, to say a few things, as well as our immediate past president and current treasurer, uh, Leon Berthy. Good, good morning. Can you hear me okay? We can. Janet, you've disappeared from our screen now. Let's try that again. There you go. How's that? Testing. We can we see can you. We can hear you. OK, very good. Thank you. Appreciate the man in the black shirt. <laughs> uh, good morning. My name is Janet McCarthy. I currently serve as the president of the Board of Trustees for Northwestern Medical Center. I come before you today as a longtime resident and healthcare professional of Franklin County. I've seen firsthand how critically important Northwestern Medical Center is to our rural community and the leadership it has demonstrated to take risk, be innovative, and think beyond the traditional four walls of the hospital, not only in our small corner of Vermont, but also statewide and nationally as well. I'm currently serving in my ninth and final year as a member of the board of the Northwestern Medical Center. Throughout the years, I've been witness to the intentional desire of the board to assure access to high quality care in a cost effective manner to our entire health service area through strategic programming, service optimization, and workforce development. It's been an extraordinarily challenging environment with our efforts to lead and participate in payment reform and population health while working to recover from considerable financial losses year after year. When faced with a leadership transition earlier this year, the Board of Trustees was deliberative in charging our transitional leadership team with the task of restoring financial stability, right-sizing our organization, and addressing workforce issues and turnover. Considerable progress has been achieved on all of these objectives 
all the while responding to one of the world's greatest challenges, the COVID pandemic. As you've heard this morning, difficult decisions have been and actions have been taken, which address the board's concerns and those that were expressed by the Green Mountain Care Board this spring. Our focus has never been sharper. The engagement of our leaders is unsurpassed. The desire of the people who live in our health service area to have access to a strong and healthy community hospital is unwavering. To be successful, we need approval of this rate increase to achieve the financial and operational sustainability to assure access to quality health care in our community. Paramount to this success, we need effective buy-in and partnership from other members of our health care system, the payers, the state of Vermont, the ACO, the Green Mountain Care Board to advance the ideals of health care reform. Thank you for the opportunity to present um, our support for the Northwestern Medical Center's budget request. I echo Don's earlier comments and words of appreciation for the work of the Green Mountain Care Board. It's my pleasure now to, to turn the presentation over to Leon Berthium, who is currently serving as our treasurer on the board of directors. Leon, are you there? Yes, good morning. There you go. Yes, I am Leon Berthium, serving as the treasurer of Northwestern Medical Center. First, it's indeed a privilege, but more importantly, a responsibility as being part of the NMC uh, board. As you know, we are well served by a strong financial team um, that you witnessed this morning, as well as in past years. In concert with the board, this team has worked diligently to present a realistic budget that will allow NMC to move forward to advance our mission. Vermont is known to lead, the Green Mountain Care Board is known to lead, and NMC is known to lead. And I will use the word lead as an acronym to really represent our presentation this morning. The L for lead, NMC is definitely leading an integral part of the health care reform that has been a cost to our organization. We continue to lead by investing in our community to improve the population health that will have beneficial on a, benefits on a long-term basis. We will also have again worked hard to be a low-cost, low-charge hospital and believe that even with this rate request, we will continue to be one of the lower-cost hospitals in Vermont. We will continue to lead by continuing to address both the short and the long term financial position of our hospital. The E really stands for earn. Our fiduciary responsibility is to protect the financial viability of the organization for our community as well as for all Vermonters. We must earn a margin to provide the ability to continue to invest in our organization and our community and to look to the future. This is essential if we're going to maintain a viable community hospital. It is also essential if we're going to retain our medical and hospital staff as well, again, recruit new members when needed to our team. Our budget presents a net operating margin of 2.3%, which is a reasonable margin growth given the prior year's performance results, but also recognizing that there's still, again, risk to achieve this level of margin. The A is for abide. We have abided by your stated criteria for our fiscal year 2021 budget. We have demonstrated through our activities and decisions that we've worked through the Green Mountain Care Board's requests, guidelines, and mid-year suggestions. Our net patient revenue is budgeted to decrease and under the growth limit of the 3.5%. We provide our best budget COVID-19 free baseline budget and related COVID-19 scenarios. We have made the difficult decisions and we've looked at where investments can be made, restructured where there were opportunities and transitioned out of services where feasible. As been noted today, expenses are down in one and a half million compared to the current year budget, not including nearly one million in inflations that were incorporated into the budget. Lastly, the D is for defend. We have presented a budget that we all can defend. 
our rate increase is needed to maintain and support and protect the long-term viability NMC. The necessary rate increase incorporates the compounding impact of the fiscal year 2016 rate reduction of the 8%. It incorporates the cost of investing in Vermont health care reform. It incorporates inflation and then considers our overall payer mix. This rate increase allows us to allow for a small net margin to reinvest in our hospital and community to sustain essential services to be effective in a viable community hospital, to meet our bond covenants, to remain competitive while being one of the lowest cost effective providers, and to also ensure that we can meet the next challenge our community may face. When looking at this budget, NMC is more than a hospital. It's part of our health care service and system. It's about serving our community, our family, our friends, our neighbors and businesses. And as a board member and a community member, I can attest that they are asking us to ensure that this hospital continues to serve them. NMC knows how to lead and we're looking at working with you in the year ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to make our presentation this morning and we welcome your questions and your comments. Thank you, Leon, and thank you, Janet. Uh, it's always good to, to have an informed and tuned in board um, really making sure that their institution is there for their community. And uh, you've de demonstrated that over the years. Leon, I'd be a little bit worried that you have a Rutland girl uh, replacing you at, at the uh, helm, but uh, we wish her well. <laughs> With that, um, I also want to uh, echo what Leon said about um, the strength of the financial team. And, you know, I've said it in the past that I've always been impressed with uh, Stephanie Bro, And uh, once again, Stephanie clearly demonstrated that she was listening to all the questions that board members have been asking over the last two weeks and really tried to um, address those in the presentation. So kudos to Stephanie for, for uh, being a step ahead. And, um, you know, I also uh, want to give my appreciation to uh, Robin for the slide that showed all the different possible scenarios on COVID. And again, it's not all the different, it's just some likely scenarios with COVID. And we all know that budgets are precisely budgets. And it, it makes me think about um, the research project that was done nearly a half century ago where uh, monkeys were asked to throw uh, darts at a list of stocks on a wall and the monkeys beat the professionals. So um, <laughs> let's hope that we have better analytics today and that um, our budgets are, are uh, much better. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, the first board member for questioning and that will be board member Lunch, Robin. Thank you everyone. And I just wanted to start by saying thank you to uh, all all of the folks at um, your hospital, including your frontline workers, your leadership, everyone for um, really stepping up during the pandemic and uh, the resulting uh, issues that we've all seen both financially and in terms of uh, healthcare issues. So thank you very much for that. We appreciate all of the work that you do for your community. Um, probably me in particular, because I will tell you I have most of my extended family actually lives in Franklin County. So <laughs> I appreciate that you're there. Um, I did have, um, and again, thank you, Stephanie, for anticipating a lot of the questions. So um, I do have a, a couple of follow-up follow -up questions um, that I'll start with. Uh, the first is um, in terms of your travelers. Could you talk a little bit more about how the travelers have kind of ebbed and flow pre-COVID, into COVID, and after COVID? Sure. Um, I can, and I, I also have Dina uh, Orfanides here with us, and she's our chief nursing, nursing officer, so she might chime in as well. Uh, but as you guys uh, heard from us at our mid-year rate increase request, Travelers was a big issue back then, right? So it has been something that 
we needed just to stabilize the core staffing on the unit. And the way that we have our unit structured is it's called a PCU, it's a progressive care unit. So it is the med surge, the, the step down, the ICU, and the subacute really all in one area. Um, of course, recognizing that, that uh, certain nurses have specialties, but just to you know, get a core staff for that team, we were having to utilize travelers much before COVID. Um, and that has actually um, just carried through COVID. And at this point, I think the most recent thing that I heard, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Dina, was that we're actually at this point having a hard time finding travelers. Um, because a lot of the travelers are being utilized in areas of the country where COVID is still a, a major issue and where they're having, um, you know, hot spots, if you will. And so we have um, most recently to try to mitigate our use of travelers um, engaged with a company that will help us uh, recruit and do kind of a nationwide uh, search for us. and. <clears throat> So we're asking them to help us identify and place uh, up to 10 RNs um, because we're certainly doing everything that we can think of here. Um, and we certainly have our uh, HR team and our recruitment team here, you know, scouring all the different places they can to look for these folks. Um, but it's our, help, or our hope that working with this new vendor, um, that they may have some connections and some people that are truly um, ready to go and so that we can start to alleviate our need for travelers uh, sooner rather than later. We won't get 10 of them on day one, um, but can we get a couple of them in a really short time period and then continue to chip away at that? So um, I'll, I'll see if Dina has anything she would like to add there. Hi, um, good afternoon. Um, Stephanie actually did cover uh, quite a bit of what I um, would add. One of the things, um, this is not um, new to the Green Mountain Care Board or the state of Vermont, um, actively participating with the pal talent pipeline led by Marianne Sheehan across the state. Um, NMC is well poised to be doing all the right things for nurse recruitment and retention. But as uh, Stephanie articulated, you know, what we have learned is uh, certain uh, travelers in our region actually ended contracts early because they could go to the southern states where they really needed help and be financially um, benefited to break their contract here at NMC. Um, but when we look at recruitment and retention of nursing, uh, you know, as others have articulated, Stephanie communicated around our partnership with Vermont Technical College. We have a joint faculty agreement. Um, one of our nurses is part of that. We plan on increasing in that space to help partner with um, academics and uh, supporting the nursing profession into the future for the state of Vermont, understanding and appreciating that we are at a gap over the next four years, 1800 RNs for our state. Um, so, uh, you know, as uh, the chief nursing officer here, uh, we're working both on recruitment and identifying those nurses that want to be here in our state of Vermont and um, having previous ex uh, experience within the state and outside of the state. I can say we are competitive in the space of loan forgiveness, tuition reimbursement, um, recognition of certifications and uh, really wrapping around what I call that healthy working environment to have nurses come to NMC and see themselves as having an opportunity for professional development um, here. So I can entertain any other follow-up questions if um, we haven't answered your traveler question. Thank you, thank you. No, I appreciate that and I'm hopeful that your new program with VTC will help um, help grow some local talent for you because that, that that seems like it's a working in other areas of the state. 
Absolutely. We're not alone in that um, vision and strategy. We're in good um, partnership with other hospitals across the state. Great. Um, I was hoping you could also speak a little more to telehealth in terms of, I know everyone really had to stand up telehealth, um, you know, like that, right, very quickly. Um, and I was wondering what your experience was at the height um, in terms if you had a sense of percentage of visits, a lot of hospitals have been giving us that as a statistic, um, and where that's now come down to. We have seen quite a large variation depending on the area of the yeah. state in terms of continued use of telehealth. So I'd love to hear your experience and some of the things that you felt were successes and can in our challenges. Yes, um, I'll hand over to Robin Alves. She has the specific data and um, certainly if there's a clinical component, we, Dr. Brophy or myself can jump back on. Thank you for that question, um, Robin. I'll tell you, we were really um, extremely pleased at how quickly we implemented telehealth through COVID. Um, as you've heard from others, uh, tele telemedicine is a platform that is um, very well suited in some instances and not so in others. Um, we uh, were very proud to be able to leverage telehealth and pediatrics to strike the right balance of making sure that um, our pediatric patients came in, stayed on schedule with their uh, vaccinations, with their well checks, um, but also um, use telehealth to identify potentially acute or RSV patients to make a determination of where on campus they needed to arrive for their care. Um, primary care was a, a tremendous um, adopter and probably where we've had um, the greatest amount of success because it lends itself to um, uh, chronic management disease, et cetera, in an interim basis. Um, specialists such as, and I'll pick on Dr. Brophy, um, being uh, our executive medical director, who's also an ophthalmologist, um, the nature of, of eye exams and, and et cetera, um, that isn't a platform that, that um, uh, we certainly used it, but that, that was maybe around 10% of our visits, whereas we really got to um, you know, 80 and 90% for primary care. Um, in other areas, ENT, if you've heard mentioned, it really was very situational in terms of the what the patient's needs were um, that, that drove our the adoptability of that. However, it is important to note that while we appreciate that the reimbursement um, was preserved for telemedicine in all of its forms, um, what we did see over that time period is um, it's not the same as an in-person visit, and I think you you um, heard that from another hospital where, um, yes, you can provide the service um, uh, with some of the relaxation around the review of systems in favor of face-to-face -face time. You might could meet the needs of the patient in the moment, but you weren't really generating any of the ancillary services that, that they may need long-term. So while we certainly hope um, that telemedicine is here to stay, that the reimbursement structure is here here to stay, um, uh, it, it, it can't meet all the needs. Um, you still have to have a safe environment for uh, patients to come on campus for things that can only be evaluated in person or when they need um, other ancillary services. That makes a lot of sense. Um, would you say um, that you saw uh, issues with connectivity or broadband? Did you see a lot of phone visits? How did that play out? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, we are uh, plagued through different parts of our um, service area with connectivity. Again, very grateful for the relaxation of um, the medium in which telemedicine was uh, able to be performed, um, a high reliance on uh, telephones um, in many instances where connectivity was a problem. Um, you know, we'll definitely say that uh, 
uh, uh, Meditech, um, I have to give a, a shout out to them in terms of their response to us and setting up our telemedicine and virtual visit capability um, immediately. And so we were able to really um, resolve a lot of that connectivity um, because the patients could connect to us through the patient portal. And oftentimes they could do that via their telephone if they didn't have uh, and using cell coverage as opposed to a, a Wi-Fi access. Thank you. That was very interesting to hear more about your experience. Um, we are getting a little bit of an echo, so I think someone needs to probably mute. Thank you. Um, I noticed in your narrative that you talked about um, a reduction in health information management. Is that an IT position or is that uh, like a data analytics pos position? I'm asking because I'm curious to hear about main, how you, if that would impact your, your ability to do data analysis uh, for the ACO program. Hi, Raman, I missed just the first part of your question. Oh, sorry. Um, on page six of your narrative, um, there is a discussion around a position called health information management, and I was curious to learn more about that in terms of whether it was straight IT or um, might have some impact on your ability. Yeah, um, when we referred to health information management, in our narrative, we were referring to our medical records department. Thank so, you. No problem. Okay. Um, so I wanted to turn to um, the rate increase, and actually, maybe it makes sense to actually reference the slide number. And my apologies that I don't have that right here so on slide oh dear i don't see a slide number so it's the risk and opportunities a slide that has the compounding effect of the rate reduction okay whatever slide that is i don't sorry i don't have the number um on my printout the so when I looked at your um, actual versus approved budgets for uh, fiscal year 2013 through fiscal year 17, I do not get the same variance of 2.9 million. Now, of course, I did also look at fiscal year 13, um, which you did not include. And, that, and so I'm hoping that you'll be able to follow up with more information for your calculation of the 2.9 million because when I look at actual versus approved, I have a $5.6 million overage of budget in 2013, a $3.4 million overage in 2014, a $7 million overage in 2015, and a $4.2 million overage in 2016. And then in 2017, you were at a little under budget at 800 and about, we'll round it up to 826,000. Um, so I think it's very important when discussing the rate reduction in 2016 to tell the full story. And the full story is that from 2013 to 2016, uh, this hospital was over its budget. And I absolutely agree that the that a rate increase is a blunt instrument. I think at the time I described it as a blunt instrument and not a scalpel as a way to address budget overages. So I, I definitely agree that, um, you know, it's certainly not a nuanced tool, but quite frankly, it is the tool that we have in this budget process. So uh, I, this is really more, not really a question, it's more of a comment, um, but I do think it's important to really tell both the full picture of that and why that rate increase was ordered in the first place. But it would be helpful um, in understanding this slide to get your calculation of the 2.9 million and to also include fiscal year 13. So that's really the follow-up on that that I would ask. Sure. And you're yeah, welcome sure. to respond, but you don't need to. No, I'll just say that um, we do have that calculation. And so I will um, absolutely send it on to you. I pulled it out, pulled it out and kind of dusted it off in anticipation of this hearing. And, you know, most of the difference, which you'll see when you receive that schedule, relates to 
the exceptions for physician transfers that go back to each of those years. So those were really years that NMC took on a lot of employed physician practices. Um, it grew for us and it grew really quickly over exactly those uh, years that you mentioned. And so we will certainly send that to you because um, we have that ready to go. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, in terms of scale, I, I am very appreciative of the analytical um, information that you provided related to scale and what would be a break even because Robin, as you mentioned in your testimony, um, like really scale is a key concept for a hospital that's trying to change its operations so that you're not, you know, that your revenues are matching your delivery system reform and that the payment reform and delivery system reform go hand in hand. Um, related to scale, I did have a couple of questions. Um, it's my understanding that at least as of May, your employees were not participating in the ACO. Is that still the case with your new TPA? <laughs> Uh, that is correct. However, we remain ready to participate um, at a point in time that the ACO is is ready for us to participate. Um, and that has been uh, something that we revisit every year. Okay. And do you revisit that with the ACO or with your TPA or both? Uh, primarily with the ACO. They, they, that's their their job. Um, we did ask Blue Cross, I think, last year, um, shortly after I arrived, and um, I believe the intent and their focus on that point in time was to uh, incorporate, and I'm going to look to Stephanie, UVM first, and they wanted to see how that, that went. Yep. Um, and, and again, um, we you know, clearly uh, are ready to um, have our employees join. Okay. And who's your TPA currently? Blue Cross. Okay, so I thought you said that you had switched. Uh, for next year. Currently, oh, okay. Blue Cross is our TPO. We will be moving to Cigna Allegiant for next year. Okay. Um, have you also worked with the Chamber of Commerce or other local employers to talk about participation in the ACO? I mean, at this point, actually, Blue Cross is participating in the ACO for its self-insured business. Um, that does not relate to scale for us. Um, uh, I would love to talk to our area um, area businesses about participation, and, and quite honestly, um, that's one of the reasons that we did change TPAs. Uh, I did entertain a conversation with Blue Cross um, back last fall on how could we work within the network to uh, to do two things. One, um, for participants in the ACO, we shouldn't be making money off of each other. Where could we uh, generate a, a a set fee schedule um, because obviously having a tertiary partner for all of us, a lot of our spend every year is out of our service area and we take the risk for that. The other thing was to do exactly that, Robin, is to um, have flexibility in the network where we could approach our own um, local employers uh, and to show um, and, and replicate um, uh, an at-risk model, but give them um, what that would look like in their community and what services could, we could provide um, to do that. And that is uh, definitely part of our strategic plan for next year. Great. Um, and did Cigna seem open to those initiatives, if you've spoken with them about it? Yes, and I, and I do want to be clear, it, it's not a matter of openness, but I think it is just a, ma a matter of structure and being able to accommodate uh, that level of flexibility. And yes, we've been assured that, that that's not a, a barrier for us with, um, with Cigna to embark upon those um, individual conversations. Great. That's good news. Um, and then could uh, I had one other follow-up question in terms of the new primary care um, and pediatric um, practitioners or providers, um, and I'm wondering how that relates to cold hollow. So um, I know, and if you could just speak to that a little bit, is this a net increase in primary care? Is it a replacement primary, you know, for folks that left? I didn't quite follow whether these were 100% new capacity or what. Uh, yes, for primary care, um, it's definitely a, a net new um, and is net of uh, cold hollow. 
Um, for, pedi uh, for pediatrics, it's a combination of replacement, but also a net new in terms of the APP. Um, we definitely uh, and, and appreciate the engagement of our pediatric group who met with us recently um, to really, uh, we're, we're having challenges around preparing for the fall with um, uh, RSV patients. And so we think an APP can help in that regard. So that's a net add. Great, okay, thank you. Um, I think that's all my questions. Okay, next we're gonna to move to board member uh, Pelham, Tom. Well, hello, I uh, am also impressed with your presentation, both at the macro level of price variation among hospitals, right down to the details of your particular budget, all to essentially level fund your budget over the prior year. So it's a, it's a huge amount of work for, actually it's a $233,000 reduction in NPR. Um, so, I, I don't have much to ask. I was worried when I first opened the binder in the narrative and I didn't see any reference to the EMR, uh, of, you know, which we went through last spring. Um, but I noticed in the, in the slide presentation uh, when I finally got that, um, <clears throat> it was there. I, I do, I do want to understand that a little bit more. Um, so last spring and today, uh, you were saying that the EMR impact on volumes was uh, an impact of about $7 million and that um, 1.8 of it, uh, you've worked out with the physicians of reducing uh, that cost a bit. Um, is that a permanent reduction uh, with, with those, those um, physician practices? Yes, it is. Okay. And so that leaves you um, with a $5 million remainder. And I, I'm just trying to understand what that is. Is that uh, an embedded ongoing loss of revenue because of, of inefficiencies that are in in the, the record exchange of the EMR system is just unrecoverable? Yeah, so we actually had estimated a $7 million impact for the current year that we're in right now. Um, and so we said, okay, well, we can attack this two ways. Um, it's a $7 million net patient revenue impact, but we do have the ability to reduce expenses and we do have the ability to try to recover some of those revenues. So we've tried to attack it from both sides. So we did the $1.8 million of expense reductions, but then we also attacked it from, you know, let's try to optimize the product and make some of these workflows more efficient um, so that we can see more patients per day and that we can eat away from the number that way as well, right? Rather than just accept that it is what it is. Um, so we've made up $2 million um, worth of ground by doing that work, by doing the optimization work, we've made up the 1.8 million by doing the expense reductions. And then we're challenging ourselves in 2021 to make up an additional 1.7 million and to have that come through the revenue side. And we're gonna do that um, by implementing some changes to scheduling. Um, so we've done a lot of work on our scheduling templates and we're gonna to continue to try to do um, as much telemedicine as we can, as long as it's appropriate, um, because it, is, it can be quite an efficient way um, to deliver care when it's, when it's done appropriately. So we feel like you know, it's gonna be, be a challenge, but we feel like we're up for it and we're gonna you know, use scheduling templates, we're gonna use telemedicine, we're gonna to continue to have um, our informatics team within IT working closely with um, the actual MAs, nurses, and providers that are in those practices to say, okay, what's still holding you up? What is still slow? What is still clunky? Um, to maximize it as much as possible. I'm not sure we'll ever fully be able to close the $7 million gap. All of the stuff I've just described closes it by five and a half million. Um, so it leaves 1.5 million, um, but we're sure gonna try and you know, I think that there is still benefit to having one EMR here at Northwestern, which for us it's Meditech, um, because it makes things so much easier from a billing standpoint. Now there's only one patient portal that you have to go to. So there is other benefits as 
well uh, mm -hmm. to having just that one EMR that we really, you know, we can't ignore. It really is much easier to do care management and care coordination when the record is all in one place. Yeah. So it sounds to me like what you're trying to do is make the best out of a bad situation that it might not be fully recoverable, but, uh, you know, you are hard at work as, as to leveraging it the best you can. Absolutely. And, you know, we're tracking the volumes really closely. We have a, you know, a master schedule that we give to our finance committee and our board every month, and it's broken down by provider. And it says how many visits they started at, you know, and then you can see the progression and where they've come. Um, so we're really watching it right down to the provider level. Um, and we're not the only hospital um, who has this <clears throat> EMR either in our physician practices. We were a very early uh, adopter for this uh, EMR on the physician practice side, but um, NVRH, is that correct, um, uses this module as well. And so the other thing we're trying to do is make sure that we um, you know, keep in contact with them and what are their lessons learned, what are our lessons learned, so that we're not trying to just operate in a silo. And, and if there are stuff that can be fixed that we haven't figured out yet how to fix it, but they have, then we obviously want to know about that. So um, last summer when we uh, came up to uh, see your, your RISE activities in action, um, and I, I did that uh, legendary dance um, <laughs> that uh, was incredibly embarrassing because I didn't know that I was being filmed. But we, we took a tour um, in downtown St. Albans. There was a building that was being built there. And I think that was where that was going to be kind of a link uh, with your nurse training program. Is that, is that all, is that building up and running? Did it uh, work out as expected? So uh, that building has, the construction on that building has not quite finished. Um, it's getting quite close. Um, and obviously they had to take a bit of a pause with construction because right. of COVID. Um, and you're right, that building is going to be the location for the nursing partnership with Vermont Technical College. And the other um, you know, space within our third floor that we have in that building um, was to have Rise Vermont and some you know, lifestyle medicine services. So we're focused on the nursing side first. We've put a pause on opening up some Rise Vermont space or some lifestyle medicine space um, because we think that we can actually accommodate that here um, within our footprint of our main campus and on our, our main hospital building. So we're gonna try to be as efficient as we can um, with our main building first, but you know we're certainly still doing a lot of Rise Vermont activities. Um, and you know you guys are all well aware that that program was our baby. And we kind of, you know, we feel like our babies left for college a little bit. And now the ACO gets to kind of act as like the hub and we get to be a spoke and we get to have, um, you know, a community rise Vermont presence. And we're certainly not gonna give that up. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanna talk just a little bit about the provider tax. Um, I noticed that your uh, 2020 budget over 2019 is about 6%, which is the, the, the tax rate um, on NPR FPP. But, you know, with the, uh, where you are relative to your um, 2020 projection, you're at 4.9%. So the delta between 4.9% and 6% is about a million dollars. And is that a kind of a risk then that you see that when you true up, you know, to pay that tax, that's a, that's a, um, that, that could be a risk? in the risk yeah, category correct. yep it is a risk so we all have to kind of pick a snapshot in time and say what's the projection as of that snapshot yep. um, for the current fiscal year and what is six percent of that number um and so you're right it is going to be um a risk and we may have uh come in a little bit over and you know at that point it will be up to us to find that offset um, i've heard a couple hospitals say that they actually have the amount um, from the state and that it is what it is. So I don't have that information. It, it kind of made me wonder why I don't. So I've, I've asked, I've sent some emails. I'm gonna try to get my hands on it. Um, yep. But yeah, we, we certainly did pick yep. a projection at the time and that's how we, how we came up with that number. Well, we're asking the same question. I was, uh, I was a little confused on both of those as to whether or not they were talking about 
the 2020 amount over 2019, which is a no number, um, but uh, this, we're, we're tracking this one down. Um, so that's it. I would just like to uh, applaud Robin on her tra Travels with Charlie video. Uh, I think that came out pretty well. Um, flash in the pan, but uh, it was fun. And it was nice to visit, visit you all when we came up to film that. So um, for that, I'll turn it back to Kevin. Thank you, Tom. Next, we're going to move to board member Yusuf or Maureen. Uh, thank you. And first, um, thank you for everything that you're doing up there, you know, particularly through this pandemic. Um, you know, it's a very difficult year for all the hospitals. And, you know, for this hospital, I think it's, uh, for me, probably the most challenging budget to go through. And, you know, we certainly want to make sure that, you know, the hospitals survive and that they're sustainable. Um, and, you know, you've given a lot of support. You've, you've shown us a lot about the pricing details, which is interesting because we're not always able to get that information in comparisons. Uh, just want to clarify a few things. You know, one of the things we don't explicitly give is commercial rate increase guidance. And that kind of gives us flexibility as we're going through the process. And it also gives hospitals flexibility when they're putting their requests through. Um, but I know for me personally, by no means does that mean if you hit your NPR number with a high increase that it meets my expectations. Um, you know, as we still need to be looking to make sure that we're giving, you know, quality, affordable care and your increase on the hospital charges is a 25% increase, which, which would, would be going to the um, commercial payers, uh, your patients, and, um, you know, and I do want to talk about the cost shift in a little minute, but uh, I think, you know, it's interesting because we all can't talk about our questioning and I'm going to go on the line similar to what Robin was doing and, you know, want to talk a little bit about history to, to just lay the groundwork a little bit because um, maybe I'm taking it personally, but it, it seems a bit like, you know, the board has put you in this position and uh, I don't agree with that at all. So I, I do want to go back through um, from 2015 to 2020, looking at some of your requests. And I'm gonna start with um, NPR. Um, in 2015, you would ask for 90.8 million in your budget. You came in at 97.6, so quite an increase. In 2016, you came in, your request was 97. You came in about 99, again, exceeding the numbers. 2017, you were about right on, 102 million to about 101 million. It was really in 2018, you requested 106, you came in at 103, and then in 2019, you requested 113, and you came in at 106. In 2020, you requested 117, and prior to February, you were down 7%. So um, the past several years, you know, part of the problem has been you're, you're missing your top line. And one of the things, you know, you've probably heard me repeatedly talk about in the hospitals is you miss the top line. You can't make moves on your expenses. You lose a lot of money. And, you know, that's, that's you know, in essence, part of what happened. Going to commercial, just to talk about that a little bit, you know, um, you requested in 2015 um, 6.4% and you received 6.4%. In 2016, you requested a negative eight and you received a negative eight. In 2017, you requested 2.9 and you got zero. So that was prior to, you know, that was looking back at all the overages you had had. And we'll talk about profitability after. 2018, you requested six, you got 3.5. In 2019, you requested two, you got two. In 2020, you requested 5.9 and you got 5.9. So there were a couple years back there where you didn't get what you asked for, but for the most part, you have gotten what you asked for in your commercial rate ass. Going to possibly, you know, going to the reason I always talk about cash is king, right? And you've, you have built your cash balances over the years because you're exceeding your bottom line. In 2015, your, in, your operating margin, um, net operating income, not your total, which is significantly higher, you had budgeted 4.6 and you came in at 10 million. In 2016, you had budgeted 2.1, you came in at 3.7 million. 
in 2017, you had budgeted 3.3 and you came in at a negative 1.2. However, your total operating margin, you had requested 3.8 and you came in 7.9. So up through 2017, the prior three years, you were building cash, you were, you were adding to your funds. In 2018, your budget was point. Uh, was 800,000 for your operating margin. When you came to us with your budget, your projection at that time was staying flat with your top line, 106 million, and basically staying flat with what you expected for your operating margin. At, you had brought it down by 400,000. Your actuals came in at missing the top line by 3 million to 103, although when you came in for your projection when you asked for your budget, you were basically on plan, and then losing 3.7 million. So again, you weren't able to cut expenses, you, you missed the top line by 3 million, that fell directly to the bottom line, plus a little more. Um, in 2008, 2019 was obviously the big year where there was a big change. You had 112 million on your forecast with a 2.7 million profit, you came in $6 million short and you lost $8.9 million. So the full $6 million that you missed on the top line fell to the bottom line and, um, and you also had some higher expenses as well. And then in 2020, um, we know that was continuing. So I, I just want to lay some of that out there because yes, you, you are in financial difficulty now as far as from your covenants, as far as we lost some money. Um, but a large portion of this is because you've missed your forecasts on top line for the past several years. If you actually look at your actual to actual trend, you've had rel you've had growth each year. Um, you went from 97.6 in 15 to 99 in 16 to 101 in 17 to 103 in 18 to 106 in 19, and you would have been trending to about 108 this year. So every year you're growing slightly, about one to two percent, but your budget requests have been significantly higher than that year over year, maybe even within the three and a half percent, the caps that we gave you. So it was approved. You missed the top line. You, you couldn't cut your expenses. It all drops to the bottom line. So I, I just want to make sure that's out there a bit because there's been a lot of, you know, whether it's news articles, different things, pressuring like the Green Mountain Care Board has has you know basically done in this hospital and has not approved things and and that's that's not the case at all um if, if you hit your forecast you would have hit more on the bottom line you missed your forecast you kept your expenses equal or higher as you went through the the um, electronic medical records and it's it's now all hitting you know the bottom line um but with that you have had well over 200 plus days in cash year over year because you were able to build that cash back in 15, 16, 17 when you were exceeding the numbers. And so that 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 is one of the strengths that the hospital does have. And I think, you know, we can't look that over as we're going through this. Um, so I just wanted to lay that out there because, you know, I, I know we now have to start with where are you now and, and what can we ex expect going forward. Um, but I, I think trying to get a you know 25% increase on hospital charges, um, in my mind, is going to be a stretch. Um, now, when we look at some of the increases that you're asking for, you specifically um, talked about the ACO, and I believe that's about seven percent of your increase of the 19.9. I know it comes down, and um, you know that that's that's an issue. We haven't particularly we haven't in the past let hospitals increase their commercial rate to cover the ACO. Um, I want and hope you will participate in the ACO, but I also don't want to be held hostage of, you know, if we don't approve this budget, then you're not going to participate in the ACO. If, if you know, I'll be candid, if, if that's what you do, you know, that's what you do. But I, I don't think that's that 7% right there is specifically tied to the ACL. I think we need to figure out how do we make that work. And you brought up, I think, three pieces in there, you know, one being not not meeting your fee-for-service rates for the, the coverage that you have, the risk reserves that you have. So um, I, I think that's going to be a challenge, you know, that, that piece in particular. Um, and so let me get to a couple questions on the told. I just, you know, 
I guess, do you want to comment on that, on, on where you feel, you know, the history has been and, and where you are right now? Sure. <laughs> A lot there. But um, no, I agree with you. I think that it is important to look at each component and to not just look at one year alone, right? We have to go back and we have to understand the history. And I think that, you know, nobody is probably harder on themselves than we are within this organization. And what could we have done differently? And where do we need to course correct? And you know, where did we go wrong? And as we've, you know, really dissected it and looked at it over the years, we feel like we made so many investments really early on to acquire primary care practices. Um, you'll remember that the, the largest by far pediatric practice in our service area was um, under distress and we took ownership of that practice because we felt it was so important for the community to have that need. Um, and then we invested in addiction services and we're so glad we were able to work with our community partner to maintain those services to our community. So you're right that there has been a little bit of revenue growth and some of that is because we've generated business and some of that is because we've had rate increases. But there's been a disproportionate amount of expense that goes along with providing some of those services. And so I think we were so uh, anxious and happy to be part of healthcare reform that maybe we went a little too hard too fast. Um, and so every time an organization adds a program or a service, you know, trying to figure out whether it has a contribution margin and whether it stands alone um, in terms of financial profitability, is it's our responsibility. It's something that we need to do, but I think it's been part um, of our issue. And I'll turn it over to Robin. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, definitely, I would like to echo that. Um, obviously, I've been here a year, but still a very fresh set of eyes and, and asking the same questions as I'm getting up to speed on, um, you know, uh, what our history has been. Um, I, I think very much so our investments in primary care and and we can unpack all of that um, in, in a follow-up if you would like but the investment in primary care the absorption of of a large pediatric practice um, with really um, you combine that kind of investment with a lack of scale in reform and this is why really and i appreciate your comment um maureen about um you know not wanting to feel like you're held hostage by highlighting uh, you know what the cost of the aco is that certainly isn't our intent but we do think it's very important we would not be having this conversation with you today if we were at the projected scale level of the aco neither would any other hospital right now whose hospital leadership and their boards are questioning participation no hospital can deliver scale on a statewide basis and that was really the entire um, desire was to educate around the challenges and the disproportionate risk that hospitals are bearing because scale has not offset what we've already experienced in terms of decline of utilization. We're committed to patient-centered medical home, which is very much aligned. It's a government CMS program that also the reimbursement hasn't caught up with the investments that they ask us to make. We need both that alignment of not just the governmental payers, but all of the commercial payers in the state to move to this FPP system to be successful. And that's why we went through the or um, the exercise of illustrating how important scale is. We have to reach that tipping point to where we can continue to invest and be okay with decline. You talk about missing the, um, the top line revenue, you're right, but you have to have utilization also to hit that. And when we're in participating all in and we're at 30% scale when we should be at 50 and a total goal of 70, um, you have to take into the impact that that has on the on the top line and there is no replacement revenue for that. The services still exist, the activities still exist and we can't cut those costs. In fact, it costs more to provide that. So it, it is very complicated and, and, and I get it and I understand and I can appreciate, um, you know, in looking at data just in black and white and how you might be per perceiving it. But we're, we're at a crossroads here around payment reform in the state of Vermont. And, you know, what isn't going to look like we have been all in we're, we're still 
um, pushing off our decision to, to, to see how as a state and as, you know, from the legislator to the Green Mountain Care Board, to the hospitals, to the ACO and to our payers, how can, what is that roadmap to, to scale? Because we can't get there. We can't get there without it. Okay, um, um, can you, you quantify for me what you think the um, electronic medical records bottom line impact has been, um, you know, 19, 20, 21, you know, from when you started the shift in both lost sales and incremental expenses? Yeah, we would have to, we can definitely do that uh, and follow I mean, up. That's a big piece of what changed right when you when you right. put in medical records and you had um you know which which i appreciate the the wanting to do that and the needs to do that it's just it had both a top line hit and an expense hit and i'd like to have you know quantified because again what we did try to press on you know in in your mid-year request was um which i know you would adjust you know did uh take that into consideration but i'm not sure you're still quite there on you know, if it's volume that's completely lost, completely offsetting that, or if it's expenses that are, you know, what's what's the net impact of this um, still as we're going forward? And you can, you know, put forward your offsets there too. Yeah, so and, and absolutely. And I'll tell you what's been, been um, uh, of course, not so much with the mid-year because um, all the data, even though we were in the middle of COVID when we had our hearing, you know, all the data was, was pre-COVID. Um, but you, you know, what's difficult is um, what's the impact of the EHR? And I don't think there's any provider in the country or any hospital that can point to and say that an EHR made them more productive. It doesn't. You hear that from 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 physicians, and the most profitable uh, practices are the ones that don't have an electronic medical record. Um, but but that's where there are other um, other reasons at play in terms of ultimately getting to that community health record to eliminate redundancy of services, duplication of services, etc. But what makes and we will definitely give it um, our best um, estimate of that impact. But we do. What's difficult is is how much of it is directly related to the EHR, but also declining utilization because between PCMH and our ACO efforts, we are declining in utilization. We are providing more services and care coordination, and we're beginning to see. You know, I would point to um, our our results with Rise Vermont and childhood ob obesity. It's unprecedented that we've reached for this community um, a level a peak. We're not rising, we're not decreasing, but but we're we should be several years out um, of even reaching that that year over year static increase in childhood obesity. And that again speaks to the impact of the that lack of scale is having in healthcare reform. I believe in it. I believe it's needed. I believe it can happen and be successful. Um, but we truly have to have the all payer model and we need to have all Vermonters in the all payer model. Thank you for that question. Just on the cost shift, and I know, and I know. you know, try, trying to show that. Um, I think I'm echoing. Maybe someone needs to mute. Um, Robin, maybe you could mute because I I do notice that when there's blue around you, that Maureen echoes. So great, thank you. Yeah, I, I think um, you know I, I appreciate your your look at at the cost shift piece. Um, I don't agree with you that when there's a 25 percent increase increase in hospital charges, that that doesn't create a cost shift. And I can give you some numbers to that, but you know, part of the reason, right, is, is part of the whole thing about the cost shift is because the government payers don't pay the full amount. And so you, you need to increase your commercial and the commercial is, ex, you know, exceeding um, your cost of services. And, and that, that's really kind of what the cost shift is. And I think part of the reason you're not necessarily seeing that in some of your analysis is because you're going off of the 20 budget that you never were going to hit anyway. So there is a, there is a growth of, of um, NPR that's related to this commercial increase, and that is adding to cost shift. And if I go to 2019, which is kind of your fixed base, you know, 20, there's a lot going on. Uh, when you're increasing by that amount, what you do see is that um, it, it does shift in how much your commercial is going up. So in in 2019, for your um, 
I think 42% of your uh, net revenue, gross revenue is coming from commercial. And when you get to net, it's 47%. And when you go to 21 now, skipping over 20, because 20 budget is not really relevant, um, you are at 42% still for commercial, and it's going up to 51% of your total reimbursement. So, so that does show, obviously, that and the other payers are going down. So there is a cost shift. It's, it's continuing it, it has to if you're if you're taking a, an increase and you really you know the fact that you had a budget of, of 116 million you weren't tracking to that budget you were going to be tracking eight percent below that so it was 108 so you're really going now from you know like 108 to 117 and a large part of your growth is this commercial increase which is cost shift so um you know, it's just not mathematically possible to take a 25% increase when the other payers aren't increasing that much and not say that that's, that's not a cost shift. So um, I just wanted to point that out. Um, and, you know, I, I do want to end with, I do appreciate all of the price stuff that you did put in there. I do think some of the metrics that we do see on the reimbursement ratios um, that you are lower than than other hospitals. Um, you know, you're you're closer from your commercial rates to the Medicaid and Medicare. You know, you're not you're not double what what um, Medicaid or Medicare is for your hospital. And so, you know, I definitely will consider that. You know, as as I go through for what to approve for commercial. Um, I know I came off hard at the beginning. I, I just really want to make sure that there is a message out there too that it is not the Green Mountain Care Board that did this to this hospital um, by not accepting rate increases in the past. Um, for the most part, you got what you asked for and then you exceeded those numbers. And that is what ends up happening. I think as Robin brought out, it may be more instrument but your commercial was coming down but the negative eight percent increase that you took you guys submitted that and that's what was approved so you know and then it does compound i agree with that so um i do respect all that you've put into this and i, I think you put a lot of hard work into this proposal um and you know i i will definitely strongly consider you know what you've put put forward um, it's a really challenging time. Um, so thank you very much. So. Thank you, Maureen. At this time, we'll move to board member Holmes. Jessica. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And I really appreciated you an anticipating some of our questions. That was uh, you obviously did your homework, Stephanie. So I appreciated that. Uh, and also Robin. Um, and I also just want to appreciate, you know, the efforts that you've made to achieve efficiencies and cost savings. I have no doubt that it was a challenge and caused painful cuts that impacted your community. So, you know, I know that was not easy to do. Uh, many of my, most of my financial comments and questions actually have been already addressed. So I'm going to go in a slightly different direction, although it'll touch on some of that. Um, one thing I would note is that you submitted a lot of very interesting um, sets of analyses and it's clear you did a lot of hard work there and I appreciated you know, the uniqueness of the approach and your efforts to tell your story um, and some of it was very compelling. Uh, I just I will say I agree with Maureen and Robin. I would like your story to at least acknowledge um, NMC's historical budget overages and your own requested rate increases. I think that's an important part of the story, but I, I think it's been discussed enough at length. Um, one chart that I liked was on the risks and opportunities uh, slide. There was a slide that you had that had the service line financial alignment with the ACO goals, you know, by attribution level. And I'm wondering, it would be really helpful to us. I mean, we can learn a lot from the analyses that you did, particularly around scale. If we want to make this thing work, we need to understand some of the, you know, uh, the obstacles. And it would be really helpful if you could follow up with which service lines are in each category. For example, you know, which two are aligned if you only have 10%, which five are aligned if you only have 30%. It looks like the work has already been done. It'd be really helpful for us to understand that. Um, and I appreciated that analysis. So if you'd be willing to share that with the board, yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> we certainly can. Um, we have, like you said, we have the data. And I can tell you um, before we send it to you that what you'll see is that the services that you would expect the higher prices, like surgery, 
for example, right? That's one where it's it's further down the line. Mm -hmm. um, the, the less expensive, the more basic the service line, the quicker you get the financial benefit from attribution. Um, the ones where there really is a high contribution margin that's being generated to the hospitals are the ones where you really need to get towards that 80% um, attribution level until you're completely incentivized. But yes, we would be happy to send some of that to you. That'd be great. It was really interesting. I appreciated that. Um, and I'm not going to delve too much into my concerns with the regression analysis. I think many of the points that an H the HCA made, I, I agree with. Um, I appreciated the effort, but again, in my mind, 10 observations does not make a regression. And um, honestly, if you're trying to explain differences in hospital revenue, you really need to include, you know, things like payer mix and case mix index and hospital designation type, right? Like those are all things that are going to influence revenue. So then using the residuals from that, anyway, I won't go on, but that was one area where I, that was a bit of a stretch for me. Um, Can I just for a second? It's completely fair um, point to make. And so I think what I've said all along is if you like that analysis, great. If you don't, you can kind of throw it out altogether. Um, and still just look at the rest of our presentation. But what we were really trying to do um, was look at it like in a million different ways possible and as many different ways as we could because we wanted to know first and foremost um, if we were missing something, if this didn't quite hold together the way that we thought that it did. Um, and I also want to point out, you know, not only um, do I want to give that recognition to the Green Mountain Care Board because you guys have absolutely been partners with us through all of this. I mean, I remember um, I was here back when that rate decrease took place and I, I just remember, you know, talking to Al Gobey and being like, can I, can I write you a check? Is there something else we can do? Because, you know, we all knew at the time that, you know, it was going to create this compounding impact. But I agree with Robin that this is the tool that we have. And so we just need to use it the best way that we can. Um, and you guys have always been incredibly um, thoughtful in your review of these budget submissions and in your conversations with us to really try to understand. Um, and the healthcare advocate was great as well. Um, we had some great conversations with them this year about that analysis in particular. And so I think everybody truly is on the same team um, and trying to get to the same place with all of this. And and none of the data that we put together, none of it was to suggest that anybody else's prices were wrong, right? Because like you said, you have to look at case, index, case mix index, you have to look at payer mix, you have to look at hospital designations. Um, so we're not in any way trying to say anyone else's prices are inappropriate. Um, we're just, we care so much about implementing a rate increase of this magnitude on our community that we had to do the deep dive and make sure that it was still, you know, these are subjective words, but still reasonable or still cost effective. Right. Fair enough. Um, I will say I found uh, the CPT code evidence, you know, that you had the, the reams of papers by every <laughs> possible category uh, compelling. So thank you for submitting that. I mean, I think that was helpful for us. You know, and it's clear that at least at the charge level um, that they do appear lower, you know, um, at, at MC than at other hospitals. And also, as Maureen mentioned, just looking at the average commercial reimbursement rate relative to Medicare is also another helpful metric for us to compare across hospitals and sort of the relative pricing. Um, so those are really helpful. Um, so one thing, just as an aside, since I'm on that page, um, it's something struck me as I was looking through that, because I literally looked through all of it. I know you may not all believe that the board members all do that we do, and I literally was reading all of these you know, CPT codes and digesting it. But um, as an aside, the first charge that was listed on there was, uh, this is going to be a, seem a little off topic, but I'm actually curious about this, was spinal fusion surgery. And the reason this stood out to me was because spinal fusion is often shows up on those, uh, you know, as a red flag on lists of low value care. There was an article, you know, in JAMA like last year that selected seven low value care procedures to assess to see whether the hospital acquired complication rates 
you know, for those particular low value uh, procedures led to more harm than good. Uh, and so spinal fusion was actually one of the seven. So the reason I was struck by that chart that you submitted was the fact that only three Vermont hospitals actually even do the surgery. And it was Northwest, Rutland, and UVM. And Rutland did 20, Northwest did 91. UVM did 229. So I'm just kind of curious if you can speak to, or maybe somebody on the on the medical um, side could just speak to the high rate of spinal fusions given NMC size and where these patients are coming from. Because it just struck me as I was reading that. Yeah, I can start and then I might ask uh, Dr. Brophy, who's here to chime in as well. But I think for a hospital our size, it really is um, literally one physician, right? So we're lucky enough to have um, an orthopedic uh, spine surgeon uh, here on our team, which isn't, you know, maybe super normal or typical for a small community hospital like us. But, um, you know, if one of those doctors really enjoys your organization and wants to practice there, then of course they're welcome to do so. So for us, um, you know, I, I, I can't get into the clinical side of it and, and why those determinations are made to either go ahead and perform that procedure or not. Um, but I'll say that, you know, for us, we're just fortunate to have that physician here and um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Brophy for any actual clinical insights that he can help provide. That's great. Thanks. Just It's a curiosity that struck me, so I'm just curious. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. I wish I had been better prepared for that. Uh, for the record, I'm uh, Greg Brophy. I'm an ophthalmologist. I'm also the executive medical director of physician services here. Um, so as an ophthalmologist, I'm poorly uh, equipped to answer that question. I, I, I can tell you uh, the surgeon doing those procedures here has been here uh, in the community for about 12 years, came from a uh, uh, larger community where he, uh, of course, only did spinal surgery. Um, I can just speak that uh, a lot of patients from uh, not just our, our our county, but from the Burlington, greater Burlington area and beyond would seek out Dr. Barnum for second opinion and surgical consults. Um, I can't speak to um, your question about it being a low value surgery, but I can tell you that all of our patients here in the orthopedic department are put through uh, kind of an optimization program to ensure that they will um, receive value, not only value from the surgery, but that it will be safe and, uh, and, and it will be effective in their long-term care. Um, so again, I can't speak to specifics about that, uh, but I can tell you Dr. Barnum has a, a, a wonderful reputation in the community and, and really in the state. And I think people travel from, uh, uh, from, from far away to um, seek his expertise medically and surgically. Okay, fair. I mean, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I, and is my camera on? Because my, 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 it is not, Jess. It's not. Okay. I can see you, yeah. Jess. We see you. Yeah, okay. Okay. Let's try that again. Am I okay? And you can see me. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, as, you know, and I, I appreciate that was that you know you didn't know that question was coming, and I you know I can appreciate you may not have the answer, but it just struck me as I was looking through all the materials. Um, so maybe just in general, I'm trying to get a handle or a little sense of why the volumes are lower. That's the new normal, um, Robin. Maybe you can answer this. You know, I, I recognize that some of it was a temporary reduction due to EMR, but what is happening? What what do you sense? Is it population decline? Is it what? Any more more deep dive into might be driving the new normal lower volume um it's a nut we continue to try and crack and i think that um you know it's problematic because um it is multi-pronged and it's how much of it is related to our efforts and to stephanie's point um early on fast and hard investing in physician services and primary care and um, and I think all hospitals, if you were to look at them, um, their expenses have risen um, exponentially uh, higher um, along that trend line of investment in in, uh, in primary care. Um, and when you're a hospital that is burdened with the risk of the success um, of, of quality and outcomes, um, the all-payer model kind of creates that incentive. If it's not the hospital employing primary care, it, it needs to be some central 
body to reach that standardization and have everyone rowing in the same direction with respect to care management and coordination and, and et cetera. So, you know, I do think the volume and we are growing. I mean, I, you know, when Jonathan gave me that statistic that we, we are one of the fewer counties that are growing, I'm like, then where's the volume? Um, and I really do think as I've um, spent a tremendous amount of time this past year working with our primary care medical director, um, Dr. Judy Fingergut, with the entire um, primary care staff, as I have um, really become a student of what the requirements are for PCMH. You're, we're actively every day approaching care from the standpoint that is absolutely the right thing to do our, to, for our patients that are a, a direct detrimental impact on our revenue. It's just plain and simple. As we get diabetes under control, we have less lab volume, we have less um, need for uh, long term for dialysis and things like that. And it's just a very complex exercise of how much of it is related to PCMH and ACO activity, um, better coordination of care. Um, also with that growth, yes, we're growing, but do we look, um, are we beginning to look a little bit like Burlington in that the growth we've had has been in younger, healthier populations? You know, we've not seen, when we get our reports back from the ACO, we've not seen a tremendous uh, year over year rise in our um, acuity level across our population. So, you know, anecdotally that, 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 informs that we're doing something right and either we're improving the health of our population or our population is is younger and and some of our risk is offset in that regard okay, okay. something john tap i guess over time um <laughs> maybe if you mute for just a second okay sure no no no, no. speak though <laughs> go ahead no i said i think that that's just you know, it's such a complex exercise. Again, um, it'd be an easy question to answer if we were um, at optimal attribution or not in at all. You know, it, it's really trying to pull two different payment methodologies and making some kind of sense out of that. It's right. an educated guess. Got it. Okay. Um, can we just turn to the ICU for a little bit? Uh, because that's been, you know, obviously it came up in the in the spring and it's it, it, you, you chatted a bit about it here in this presentation and I really want to understand it a little bit more. Um, so it sounds like moving to telehealth to get to a positive contribution margin on that. Moving to, it doesn't, tele-ICU doesn't move to a positive contribution margin. You're still going to lose money even though it's no, it's it's already profitable. Okay, it's already profitable. Already profitable, strengthening that okay. profitability and positive contribution margin. Okay. Um, so do you, you have, is it six beds? Is that what you have there? Six ICU beds? What is the number of beds? We have uh, 10. 10. And we'll be wired for 10. Okay. And so what is the average occupancy rate of those beds like on a weekly basis or daily, average daily occupancy, those 10 beds? Currently it's like one per day. True, 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 I, true, true ICU, ICU, one per day. But we use the other nine. I mean, again, as, yeah, as Stephanie said, it, it's a progressive care unit. And so as patients, um, improve during their stay, then they're in different classifications. Okay, so you have a truly critical care patient that maybe only be one a day, but you'll use the other nine beds for alternative uses, progressions or along through that. Staging their, through staging their, their care, yep. Got it, so, okay. Step down. Step down, okay. Um, I, you know, there was a, I mean, I guess I'm the quality person today, um, question, you know, actually all, probably all week, but I, the reason I ask a little bit about this is because there was a recent article that came out, I don't know if any of you saw it, but it was in the news about, um, it was in JAMA, but then it was picked up by the news that COVID patients, I don't know if you saw this, that were admitted to hospitals that had fewer than 50 ICU beds. So that's what they determined by the study was a small ICU was fewer than 50 ICU beds. But patients who were admitted to those hospitals had a more than threefold higher risk of death than patients who were admitted to larger hospitals. And so I think about, you know, do you, you know, I know you've got travelers in there. I know you have, you know, do you have an in, 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 um, a critical care internist in there uh, or physician in there? How do we make sure that the quality 
given the small volume, is going to be maintained um, at an ICU of that size. And I think about this in reference to Porter. Porter Hospital had a small ICU. They uh, decided to shut it down a few years ago. It was, I think, largely a financial decision, but they were even farther away from, from UVM, um, and they still made that decision. It was a better decision for them. Obviously, every hospital is different, but I'm wondering how quality factors into your decision about the ability to maintain an ICU. Sounds like the finances are working. Um, I will say, my understanding is that UVM has, they operated 80% occupancy, so there is capacity at UVM to take additional patients, but, and that we heard directly from UVM. So anyway, yeah, you can uh, maybe think to that. That'd be helpful. Sure, sure. I'm going to um, turn it over in just a second to, to our CNO, but, you know, I will say that, um, uh, we do have um, a hospitalist and hospital-based medicine here. Um, we uh, do provide very high quality services. This will only strengthen that. And I think that capacity rate, um, I didn't hear 80%. I heard more that they were at, at like over 90% um, uh, utilization. Um, but I'll let Dina speak to, to those care coordination activities and, and the times in which we, um, which there isn't a bed available. So um, Dina, if you could answer sure. that question, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think you really bring up some very valid points and I would say that um, I've been in my role as the chief nursing officer into my second year. So coming and uh, having a fresh set of eyes as the uh, chief nurse here really looked at the services in which we provide it um, here at NMC and absolutely did the analysis with my CMO partner, John Menendeo, who also at that point um, had oversight for the hospitalist service um, did an analysis to understand because I, I agree either you're in the business or you're out of the business for quality of care, high risk, lo uh, low volume. Um, doing that collaboration with Dartmouth Hitchcock with understanding the service that they are um, able to provide the patients here at NMC, uh, what we did understand, although there are certainly our partnership. It's not to take patients from the tertiary center. They absolutely, there's a subset that has to absolutely go to the medical center, but appreciating that although we could uh, potentially transfer all critical care, their capacity to take all those patients um, would likely not be able to meet the need um, in for, for our patients here in Franklin County. Uh, having said that, the partnership with Dartmouth really will realize a, a, an increased um, uh, collaboration in regards to the quality of care. As a nursing leader, uh, appreciating nurses, new nurses coming into the environment, not having the expertise and experience, and at the other end of delivering a standard of care that would have an expert nurse looking at that patient with a new, newer, less years of experience, we will only increase our competence and, and, um, and our delivery of care for our patients. In addition, having uh, also intensivist critical care trained docs at the other end of the, of the collaboration, really working with us in that clinical integration, breast evidence-based practice, policy and procedure will enhance our ability not only for critical care patients, but we do have an average daily census. And I'm looking to my finance colleagues of about uh, 10.2, I believe, of step-down level care, in which we also are awaiting beds for UVM for those STEMIs for, that we're not able to get over to the cath lab because they need that intervention we're unable to provide. So, um, you know, I think recognizing, I hear what you're saying as a clinical leader, but feel really excited and confident in our uh, work in this space. 
uh, to support the care of the patient. We anticipate that we'll be going live with tele-ICU. And it's not like we're going to turn it on and have droves of critical care. It's really to enhance the care that we're already required to deliver. Um, and we anticipate that to um, launch in November, December timeframe. So I hope I um, added some value to uh, what we're trying to accomplish here. No, I really appreciated that answer. Thank you very much. You know, I just, it's something I've been thinking about and I, I appreciate yeah. your answer and your attention to the quality. And no, that's helpful. Yeah, and just to also um, inform, certainly uh, myself having conversation as well as Dr. Minandeo with our colleagues at UVM, um, both Peg Gagney and in her interim chief nurse role, as well as um, Ryan Clouser, who has oversight of critical care to talk through, here's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, they're, they're supportive and appreciate and value that, that partnership um, with Dartmouth. And Dartmouth will also collaborate with UVM in terms of our transfers to get patients to the medical center. So I, I think um, we're heading in a really good direction for, region, for the region, for uh, care of Vermonters, uh, in particular in Franklin County. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, my final question actually is, uh, you know, NMC has always had incredibly strong community support. You know, we, we witnessed that firsthand when we have our um, mobile board meetings and we've gone to St. Albans and Tom has danced, which is always fun. We hope we get to see that again. Uh, but typically during in-person hearings, you know, um, usually there's a lot of community members and I suspect maybe there are some on the call, but in person we always have a lot. Tom, don't give me a thumbs down. Um, but uh, but so I'm wondering, you know, and we've actually received public comments from your community members. Uh, I don't think we've received public comments from other hospitals, at least not at the at the frequency of NMC. So I'm wondering, you know, about fundraising as another revenue source. You have such incredible support in your community. Um, and Grace Cottage, I know, has tapped into this and it's helped them financially become more stable. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit, this is my last question, about NMC's fundraising efforts, trends over time, particularly now. Are you seeing an outpouring of financial support from your community to help get you through some of the current issues? How is that looking for you as a revenue source? Thank you uh, for that question. I'll tackle it. And, and we have Jonathan Billings here, our Vice President of Planning, who can also chime in um, if we need him to. But you are 100% correct that we have an incredible community and that we have incredible community support. Um, and we have done the fundraising um, in the past. We uh, did a major capital campaign um, back when we built uh, the medical office building and we renovated uh, our PCU. And um, we had great response from our community and from our employees. And so I think every hospital tries to strike the balance of you know, how often do you ask and what are you asking for? We had the community come uh, in droves at the onset of COVID because they just wanted to make cloth masks for us so badly um, and they wanted to provide whatever PPE that they had available. And I've heard similar stories um, in the other budget presentations. Um, so I know that, you know, all the communities around Vermont love their community hospital and, you know, the hospital really does act as kind of the center point for the community. Um, and so you're absolutely right. And we continue to evaluate fundraising efforts, look at fundraising efforts. We have uh, talked about the idea um, for emergency department renovation. Uh, you might remember that that was part of our certificate of need. Sure. But at this point, we have um, you know, really relied on that as a tactic to help with capital investments. Um, and not so much just to sustain operations. Um, this rate increase will be enough of an ask for our community. Um, and so we don't have, I just want to be transparent, we don't have any formal um, fundraising campaign plans at, the, at this time um, that are just to sustain day-to-day -day operations. So I hope that answers your question. 
Yeah, although I guess what you just raised is an interesting point that the rate increase is a lot. So I'm just wondering, do you offset some of that rate increase with a with a fundraising campaign and therefore get some of the revenue from people who can afford to pay it versus a blanketed, you know, 20 percent on everybody? I mean, is there a, is there any thought to doing that, to increasing fundraising and offsetting the commercial rate ask? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting idea and concept. I haven't had any specific conversations, but I'm sure Jonathan has has certainly probably wants to yell at me from across the table right now with a perfect answer um, about what we have done. But, um, you know, I think that we've, I, I know I touched on affordability during my presentation, but there's just no way to do it justice, right? When we have an hour to give a presentation, I wanted to address the elephant in the room um, but there's just no way to, to truly do it justice. So, you know, I heard Mike um, from the HCA, I think it was, you know, before, you know, during UVM's uh, budget presentation, I heard him say, you know, I think it's possible for us to really show our gratitude and our appreciation for everything that hospitals did during COVID. But I think it's also possible for us to go through this process and to really ask the tough questions. and. And those things don't necessarily necessarily conflict with one another, right? I think he said something along those lines, and it really struck a chord with me because it's been a struggle uh, internally putting this budget together and submitting it. Um, and so I guess what I would say is, you know, we can we can feel sad about it, um, and you know that the fact that it's going to be difficult for our community for us to implement a large rate increase, but at the same time, it can be the right answer. And it can be exactly um, the right thing for us to do, and those things, you know, don't necessarily conflict with one another. Great. Um, That's it from me. Unless somebody else has another response to that, sorry. I just, yeah, I just would like to tack on to that. I think um, one of the things that has struck me in the past year is just the incredible generosity of our com community, um, many of whom are still supporting and continuing their pledge support from our MOB uh, medical office building. And so, you know, that wasn't just a one time. You know, many of our our community, you know, members, um, they had to pledge over a period of time um, to to make a contribution. I'd also say and, and point to our efforts that that's, uh, Stephanie spoke to earlier in, in the um, uh, our efforts with the HCA around our financial policy. We greatly expanded that. Um, um, and then, too, I think you have to uh, realize, um, again, our payer mix and, uh, and the ability um, uh, of our community to, you know, to, to give in that way. Um, so we did. Uh, we do think we've strike uh, have stricken a balance in our rate request with what our community uh, can provide. And and again, that doesn't go. I think it's a, an excellent point. And and as Stephanie said, we will uh, reach out to our community and those who are able um, uh, when, as we approach our um, emergency room renovation. Great. I, I, I want to thank you. You know, obviously a lot of candor here, a lot of tough questions from the board, a really tough budget to put together in a year of uncertainty. So thank you for all of that. And uh, I, I'm done. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Jess. Uh, I think my first question will be for uh, Janet McCarthy. Um, Janet, um, <laughs> I don't want to depress everybody, but it's hard to believe that the summer's almost over. And we're just a, a few months away from um, really what could be a double whammy of flu and COVID. And I'm curious if there's a community effort in Franklin County between the VNA, between NMC, between providers to really try to get as many people um, the flu shot as possible. And if there is, are those numbers um, as far as expense worked into this, this budget here? So I'm happy to re respond to that, Kevin. You know, I think one of the beauties of Franklin County is the collaborative nature that all of the healthcare providers have had. So um, we've been working very closely um, from the Home Health Agency with the Health Department, with Northwestern Medical Center, uh, Northwestern Counseling and Support, our uh, federally FQHC. Um, I'm trying to remember who else is uh, all the nursing homes, long-term long care. care facilities um, to address exactly that question. Um, how do we promote the influenza vaccine across our county to try to minimize the 
twindemic if we can. Um, but in addition to that, we're also using it as a demonstration and a test kitchen, if you will, for what we hope will be massive COVID vaccination um, in the springtime. Um, so I think there's a tremendous amount of collaborative effort um, being being made. I think, um, you know, how does it impact the budget? Um, I'm, I can't really speak to that, but, you know, I will tell you that there's just a huge sentiment that we're going to do whatever it takes locking arms to make sure that our community is as safe and as healthy as it can with whatever ball gets thrown our way. Last year, I got to uh, personally witness the efforts that Rutland uh, put forward, and um, they were giving away free flu shots to the community. And it was interesting to walk in and see um, nurses dressed as clowns interacting with children as they came in and and just the incredible job that was there. So uh, I hope that we as a state can uh, meet this challenge so that we're not uh, overrun with uh, two things hitting us at once. Uh, my next question is for Stephanie. Um, and you're not the first hospital to mention this, but denials. Um, is it because um, things were inappropriately coded or billed? Or um, what's, what's the story behind uh, denied claims? I must not be, because I think we always bill everything perfectly. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it is a mix, and so that's our job is to really go through the denial management process and figure out um, what categories that particular particular denial fits in. So, was it something that we did inappropriately? Was it something that, from a documentation standpoint, and this is the majority of it, right? So, the documentation we feel is there to substantiate and support the charge, um, but the per the payers often looking for additional documentation, and so. Again, Again, we try to trend those um, so that we can make changes to the documentation within the electronic medical record uh, to keep it from happening again in the future. Um, so most of the time they're documentation related, I guess, is the short answer to your question. Is it across all carriers or is there a specific? Um, it is across all. I mean, again, the commercial uh, family here in Vermont, you know, is small enough to say, you know, it's usually Blue Cross, MVP, Cigna, um, with Blue Cross being the largest commercial. So that's the largest uh, volume that we see. But I think it, you know, follows and trends the way that you would expect it to, you know, here in the state. Okay, great. It's good to know that it's not just somebody saying no, period. So that's a, a good thing. Um, this is kind of more of a statement than a question. Um, knowing that you're moving to Cigna, um, back a few years ago, uh, the state of Vermont lost a Supreme Court uh, decision in um, Liberty Mutual versus Algo Bay. And basically, um, these carriers were not required to submit their data to the all claims payer database. And yet, um, many still have. Blue Cross did a great job of reaching out to um, people, and they had a, a, a very, very large compliance with um, supplying the data. What we've learned is that there's not a cost to um, people paying for the insurance to have this um, data shared with the da state's database, and it's just a, a very helpful, whether it's research or um, work done by the board to have as much data as possible um, when making decisions. So hopefully you'll ask Cigna to just turn on the switch. We've had others that we've reached out to and spoken to that are Cigna clients. And once they asked, it was not a problem and no cost to the organization. So um, that's just a, an ask in advance. Happy so you don't show up on a list a couple of years from now as not having any data in the all claims database. Um, and um, the next, and I guess this will be my last question, but it's it's a tough one. Um, and you know, I live in a part of the state that has seen um, a decline in population, and we've seen um, two institutions of higher learning close. So we're definitely seeing decline, and and that's not unusual for a a great portion of the state of Vermont, except where you draw that circle around uh, Burlington, you happen to be 
part of that circle around Burlington. So as you mentioned, you have had some growth, and yet with that growth, you haven't um, met what you projected to be your increases as an NPR. And at the same time, over the last few years, we've seen UVM make an argument that they have uh, a large increase in um, um, net identifiable, identifiable patients. And it's not just coming from New York State, which would be a great thing if it was just more business coming into the state of Vermont, because that's really economic development. But what they've told us is that um, these you know, new unique patients that are, that are uh, being identified, um, they're coming from Vermont. And with you being so close to them, do you think that that could be a problem that um, people in Franklin County are deciding that to go to a larger institution? Just because they can, they have the ease of the highway. Okay. Um, yep. Well, Ron. Uh, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. No, I am happy uh, uh, to, to jump in on this one, and and certainly um, Stephanie can can add color. But um, I think. Uh, um, I'll just relate a story that um, of a meeting that we had recently with uh, with the general surgeons here uh, in private practice in our community, and uh, mentioning how many patients, new patients, he's getting from Burlington, because the patients can get in here more quickly for basic services, um, and I'm sure that the opposite of that can be said as well. I think a lot of our growth and um, it's so new, I think it's too early to really tell what that trajectory is. But, you know, I liken it to, uh, of course, I'm more of a city girl. I, I uh, um, spent large parts of my uh, adult life in Atlanta and in Nashville, both areas that have seen a lot of growth. And and to me, what I see is, 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 is St. Albans becoming um, benefiting maybe a little bit from a bedroom community. So they may live here, um, and sometimes it may be more convenient for them to get their service here uh, where they live, but if they work in Burlington, then then maybe it's a convenience factor. And I think that the trend is just too, too new. Um, to, uh, you know, we need to pay attention to it, but I think it's too new to draw some uh, conclusive um, uh, ideas that I'd want to put numbers around. Have to remember to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Um, thank you. And uh, thank you for a very uh, um, good presentation today. And at this point, we're going to um, turn the questioning over to the healthcare advocate. And Eric, are you doing the questioning? I am doing it again. I guarantee you, Stephanie, I will not be as eloquent as Mike. So forewarning apologies. Um, first off, just thank you for everything you're doing during this crisis. I, mean, I want to acknowledge uh, the work you did with FAP. I think they're, you know, it's, it's, you know, removing the geographic restriction, the simplification, and the increase up to 400 percent of FPL is substantial and uh, put you guys in this small group of Vermont hospitals who are doing that. Um, I also just want to note, since it wasn't discussed, there were substantial improvements made to the consumer facing language, and that is just as important. And so kudos for that. Um, I also want to thank NMC and um, Devin in particular for the responses about in discussion about the regression analysis. Um, and for the clarifications on what you were trying to do that you submitted with your answers to our question, I think questions, I think in light of those clarifications and kind of considering the sum total of what you did, you know, and I said this to Devin, I think reasonable analysts could disagree about the utility of it. And although perhaps I wouldn't have used it that way, um, I could see, given the context and this issue about doing applied work, why someone might choose to do it for exploratory purposes. I think looking at your presentation, there were a few things that I just want to comment on that 
struck me as really interesting ideas and connect really well with other work the board is doing. Um, one is dealing with this issue of the small number of Vermont hospitals and how we look at financial and utilization data. I think um, VUD's uh, hospital usage data set um, is underused. I think uh, board analytics staff is well aware of that. And as we all struggle to figure out how to operate um, in this world of 14 hospitals, um, I think, you know, it, it would be wonderful to work together. I think NMC and other hospitals have unique uh, lived experience that in, can inform how it should be used um, that other people just don't have uh, or I don't have. I think also the discussion of the issues of um, travel time are very um, well taken. I think in Vermont, not only do we have a complicated geography, we have issues of a lack of density in roads. So when one road gets blocked, that can cut off, you know, the entire access of that population, as opposed to cities where you just take another street. We also have a huge difference in road surface types. Um, and as anyone knows, uh, in mud season, if you live on a dirt road, it is, you are not going the speed limit. So travel costs, complications um, are real. It's not necessarily something that's been dealt with. Um, and I think, you know, it fits very nicely into the HRAC. Um, and I hope we've started discussions in light of that and uh, with board uh, staff. They have a wonderful geographer that they just hired. So hopefully we can all get our heads together and begin to describe the system better. Um, so I was wondering now that, you know, having a FAP um, is one part of it, and this real issue comes forward with how it's implemented. Um, and looking at, you know, your ratio of free care to bad debt, you're a pretty substantial outlier amongst Vermont hospitals, um, both in 2020 and um, in 2021. So actually the lowest or the highest ratio. I don't know how to describe that. Um, and also as a percent of gross patient care revenue, uh, your free care is really low, your bad debt is really high. And I was wondering if you've thought about how to deal with this issue of implementation. And my guess is some of those folks who have bad debt actually should be signed up for Medicaid or should participate in the free care program. Yeah, I want to speak to that for a minute um, because, you know, it's something that we have, and I think other organizations have as well. We've really struggled sometimes with knowing that a patient would qualify for our free care uh, program if we could only get the information to do so. And so um, I think what we're trying to do, um, we have a wonderful uh, gentleman named Brian at the front of our hospital located right in the lobby. Um, and that is his entire day is to um, work with patients to try to get them qualified uh, for, for financial assistance um, if we can get them qualified for that. And so we also uh, put the information on the website and we put it in the local United Way office and from time to time we'll put it in our local paper. So we're constantly looking um, for new ways to get the word out there. And if you have um, you know, other best practice ideas that you've seen other hospitals implement, I would really love um, and appreciate if you could send those along. Um, I hope that the changes that we made uh, to the policy and to the eligibility also start to move that in the right direction. Because um, I think I shared with you, you know, when we came down to see you folks in the fall, that, you know, we truly agree with you that these amounts are falling to bad debt. And so I don't think it's going to have, you know, really this harmful financial impact on NMC to move those amounts from bad debt to free care and just get them where they're supposed to be. Um, so we're all in on that effort and um, we really uh, are, are trying to do everything that we can think of. And, and like I said, if there's some more innovative stuff 
Um, you know, we've talked about predictive analytic models at the registration process that can help you predict and get somebody qualified. Um, we also uh, work with our local FQHC and say that if you have been approved uh, for free care through the FQHC, then you don't have to do our application process. Just send us a copy of, of that um, acceptance and we'll use it and that'll be acceptance for us as well. So we're also trying to be innovative and do some different things like that. Um, because they won't disagree with you that our number is lower than we want it to be. And I, I think, you know, at, at a time, you can hold me to this, Stephanie, I think at a time when we're not in crisis, so hopefully in a year, um, it would be good for the system as a whole and the individual hospitals to have a working group. So I think there are some rather interesting practices in other hospitals and to begin to have knowledge share across hospitals, I think is a real opportunity to better the system as a whole. Um, I just wanted to clarify um, some of the comments in um, the ACO, preserving ACO risk. Um, of course, there is some variation in what your auditors tell you to do. Um, I, I just wanted to point out, I, I do not actually think it's a true statement to say that most Vermont hospitals are doing reserving the risk. Um, I think there is substantial variation between hospitals. I think that variation is a real problem when looking at the hospitals and trying to compare them. Um, and it's a real opportunity for the board to, we should have a standardized metric um, for how risk is treated. Um, so I think it's a, it is a real problem. I, I do not think though that the majority of hospitals treat it one way. Um, and I think lastly, you know, and you've hit on this, I, I just want to point out that there's a real concern uh, for our office this year with the large single year rate increases. I think um, there are many of them. I obviously, as you've acknowledged, uh, NMC's uh, is a upper outlier. Um, and it's a feeling that these large single year increases really put an undue burden on consumers that, you know, are currently facing an economic crisis with COVID. Um, there were already issues with affordability, which we're all well aware of. And I think um, with the movement towards less rich plans, insurance plans, um, and higher deductible plans, um, the amount of patient share is growing and that's really concerning with this level of increase because that will be borne directly by consumers. I think also in a, you know, I, this isn't that, you know, FAPs and what you've done is absolutely wonderful and I, and provides protection to some of our, the most at-risk Vermonters. I just want to point out that when you stack um, an FAP policy on top of the subsidy cliff that already exists, that we are leaving out this population of households 500 to 600% of FPL um, who cannot bear this cost completely, but will be bearing this. And I don't, you know, this isn't, perhaps this is an issue with our overall financing of healthcare, um, definitely not one that NMC could resolve, but it is a real concern of that with these large increases, how that population above 400, say to 600% of FPL, who really can't afford to pay more for their care, are hurt. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, thank you for those comments. Um, I certainly, during my presentation, wasn't attempting to um, address how other hospitals are booking their ACO risk reserve. Um, I'm not aware of how each one does it. Um, so I, you know, I can't speak to that, but just how we are booking our reserve uh, in particular. And then um, lastly, on the question and comment about affordability, I, I completely appreciate it. Um, you know, as somebody who uh, whose family uses this hospital, <laughs> right? I know that um, we're all gonna take that very, very seriously. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, I, I just hope that um, Vermonters can recognize that Yes, it's a large increase, 
at the end of the day, after the increase, it's still a very cost-effective provider. Um, and if you look at the rate increases over the long term, one year is hard. One year is hard. Um, but you look, if you look at them over the long term, you know, they're still below the system average. And, you know, really what we think that we need, we certainly uh, didn't put together a budget with this rate increase because it's a rate increase we wanted, right? Nobody wanted to have to be in the position um, that we're in having to ask for it. But I appreciate your comments because we take it to heart and we take it very seriously. Thank you. And, you know, I, it's not... I in no way meant to imply that it was intentional. You don't take it seriously. It's uh, just pointing out the, the situation on the ground as we see it. And, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate situation. That's absolutely not MMC's fault. Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, Eric. Next, we're going to move to public comment. And I am going to take people one at a time. Um, there have been a number of people who did um, ask to uh, speak already. And I'm going to start by calling on um, Jeff Tiemann. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. I want to I just start by thanking the team at Northwestern Medical Center and also at Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital and really all the hospitals um, for the really hard and careful work they did to prepare these budgets uh, while they're also managing COVID. Um, and, and I think in the spirit of gratitude, I also want to thank the Green Mountain Care Board and the healthcare advocate and uh, both board members and staff for the hard work that you do and the thoughtful questions you come up with and the careful evaluation you do of this really intricate information. Um, I think you know better than anyone that the work you do is hugely complicated, but also hugely consequential. Um, you know, for 12 years, I worked for a nun who said that budgets are moral documents. Um, and that's because they reflect priorities and accountability to the people that we serve. And I think this year in particular here in Vermont, you are evaluating budgets that have that dimension, that are each hospital's reflection of their best sense of how to stay strong for their communities and for our entire state as we continue to manage really the most uncertain environment any of us have ever known. Um, as I said at the beginning of this cycle, these budgets um, are responsible, they're thoughtful, they're careful, um, and they accomplish a few things. They enable hospitals to build on the strength, build their strength following years of small margins and losses, um, continue their work to effectively treat patients and manage the pandemic statewide, um, and be prepared for even more or greater challenges this fall, which we know is a, is a, likely, is a likelihood, unfortunately. So I just hope that you share that sense of urgency around the vital importance of our hospitals and keeping them healthy and stable and strong um, I, I can tell you that as a hospital and provider community, and even as Vermonters, hospital leaders certainly understand the pressure um, that the board feels to, um, to reduce budgets or manage them in the name of affordability. I would just emphasize there that these budgets reflect very modest, if not super thin margins, um, that are needed to continue carrying out the mission of each of these organizations. They reflect how each hospital thinks, to use the Green Mountain Care Board's language, that they can be sustainable for the coming year. Um, so, and you know, lastly, I would just say our nonprofit hospitals uh, deeply appreciate the need to manage affordability, um, as Eric was just discussing, which is why they continue their commitment to health reform efforts, um, and why you heard a consistent endorsement of value-based care across all of these hearings. Um, it, it's also worth noting that the public really wants and expects right now for their hospitals to be strong. Recent public opinion research shows that really definitively. Americans are concerned about the vitality of their hospitals like never before. They want to see them there and available. Um, and I'm happy to share that data with the board if it would be of any interest. So with that, I'll conclude by asking once again, as I always do, please first do no harm. Your number one priority should be to stabilize our system and make sure that it's continued ability to serve Vermonters effectively. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jeff. And, and yes, the board would very much welcome that data. It's uh, something that, that we look forward to reviewing. Um, next on the list, I have Judy Ashley. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I will be brief. Um, I know you've had a long day already. 
Um, I am one of the incredible community members that Dr. Holmes mentioned. And yes, I have financially donated to NMC as much as I am able. Let me start by saying that I am afraid. For nine years, I served on the NMC Board of Directors and two years as president. But today, I'm speaking to you as a community member who lives in Swanton. I continue to be involved as one of the 150 local residents who make up the NMC Incorporators that provides a voice of the community in the strategic planning process, and we are a source of local perspective to help inform the direction of the hospital. In December, I will be 70 years old, <clears throat> and although I don't like to admit it, I guess I qualify as a senior citizen. Um, I am also someone who has experienced health issues, which were treated by NMC, as well as UVM Medical Center. At NMC, I know that the people in my community are taking care of me. I am being taken care of by people I know and trust. On the day of my colonoscopy, after I have endured the pre-procedure process of cleaning out my colon, I am met by smiling, welcome faces at check-in. As I am prepped for the procedure, the anesthesiologist passes by my door and stops. She comes in to say hello. This is a young woman I have known for years. I know her family. I know that she decided to go to medical school in her 30s after a career as a registered nurse and a public health nurse. I know the first name of my surgeon who will perform the procedure. When I wake up from my procedure, I see the smiling face of the CEO, who just happened to be making rounds, asking me how I'm feeling. This is what makes NMC a true community hospital. There was a time when I needed to get frequent blood work done, and my choice was NMC because I hate, truly hate getting my blood drawn. On occasion, I have fainted. That is when I met Josh. She was an exceptional, exceptional phlebotomist who understood my fear and treated me with kindness and understanding. And I barely knew she was drawing my blood. She made me feel comfortable by talking about family and events around the community. So why am I sharing this with you? For me, these are just two examples of what a community hospital offers versus a larger medical center which provides a different level of needed service. It's sort of like the difference between going to your local town clerk versus the Department of Motor Vehicles. Listening to NMC's presentation today and in previous years, it is clear that we have not only exceptional medical staff providers, but also exceptional staff across the organization who care deeply about our community hospital. I am afraid of losing the incredible services that are available to me and to the rest of the members of my community. A local community hospital provides quality care with a personal touch. I urge you to help us maintain this truly special organization that delivers quality care in a healing environment. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, next is um, Joe Halco. Joe? Uh, thank you, Chairman Mullen. To piggyback on Judy's comments, um, I have been involved as a community partner with NMC for over 20 years. When we talk about community, as we've talked this morning and, and into the afternoon, let's not forget that there's a lot of rural areas to the service area that NMC provides. I think a lot of times when people talk about NMC's proximity uh, to say the UVM Medical Center, we talk about 28 miles on an interstate. However, you can't say that to a young child who needs emergency assistance and lives in Richford, and it's quite a haul just to get into St. Albans or someone from Berkshire or Highgate. So truly, NMC is the regional community hospital that we want to make sure is available for access to those that need services when they need them in a quality manner. 
you know, we try to look at the fact if NMC did not exist, that care would be provided elsewhere. However, I have to believe that that care would be provided at a much higher cost as well. We talk about improving population health, and I think it's something that's been on the front burner for several years now. And certainly you've heard today, there are a variety of areas where NMC has been a leader and a recognized leader in some instances with what they have done as far as patient-centered medical homes, quality preventative care. Of course, there's the Blueprint for Health initiative that they've been a leader on. RISE Vermont, which was founded right here in this region. And then lastly, uh, the Regional Clinical Performance Council in which NMC and NCSS collaborate together as chairs to have quality improvement initiatives that include all of our community partners. And I need to say this part of the state, and when we talk about community partners working with a hospital, I would put this region up against any region in the state of Vermont as far as collaboration in wraparound services around the individuals who live and work in our region. You've heard a lot today about the financial sustainability efforts that the organization has made recently, and they have done a phenomenal job with the four and a half million dollar savings, which includes, as you've heard, everything from service line adjustments to voluntary and involuntary reductions in force and things such as revisions in the employee benefit program. NMC has demonstrated time and time again that as a community hospital, they certainly are a leader for Northwestern Vermont. And I would agree with what Judy has to say, which is this is a critical moment for NMC. And we would hope that the decision that you make on the ask that they have put forward to you is something that you will seriously consider. Because I think from a standpoint of not only the hospital, but all of those living in Northwestern Vermont, the time is right to ensure the sustainability of our community hospital. And as it's been expressed already, even with the requested rate increase, NMC will continue to remain as one of the lower priced hospitals in the state of Vermont, providing high quality health care. And as the board treasurer, Leon Berthium, earlier stated, this would allow NMC to continue to lead. I want to thank you today for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts and uh, wish everyone all the best. Thank you, Joe. The best to you as well. Uh, next on my list, I have um, Reg Bellavo. Reg? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? We can. Well, thank you for uh, this privilege to be able to, to speak with you folks today, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Reg Bellavo, and I'm the village manager for, uh, for Swanton. Uh, we're a community. We have two governments here, but uh, with both governments, we have one mission, and it's to provide a safe, healthy, and positive uh, community and uh, grow in the middle of... Uh, uh, all of this pandemic and a lot of that positive growth is made possible by the work with NMC. Um, I'd like to, uh, I kind of talk off the heart more so than, uh, than read, but I took some notes. Uh, this is, I'm hoping today that uh, I can speak with the potential impact if we lose programs and services that NMC has been providing us over these years, in particular, the Rise Vermont which uh, in my case is one of the biggest opportunities that they've offered here in our community. We've been working hard up here in Franklin County to revitalize our communities. You can see that uh, possible in St. Albans, Swanton, we've worked tirelessly to improve our community and you can see it bleeding over into Highgate and Enosburg. Uh, this work could not be able to advance uh, if NMC would lose services or even uh, its facility. Uh, local uh, facilities or local services are vital to the growth of our community. Uh, a good fire department, good schools, solid police force, and a hospital was what makes people want to come to your community. And that's what drives economic growth and brings good jobs to the area. Um, 
Our small community is vital to the growth and sustainability of the Vermont Way. Our real, rural communities need NMC in order to continue to prosper. Uh, and I'll just mention one thing too, and I probably shouldn't, but uh, living in Franklin County for 35 plus years, it always seems that you know the Northeast Kingdom and uh, this Franklin Grand Isle area, we get pushed aside and lose funds that affect us deeply. Uh, we work hard to manage with what small budgets we have and being a community leader, I know what it means to have to do that. Uh, but I would very strongly and uh, vehemently uh, support any increase that NMC uh, presents today uh, because it benefits us uh, not only uh, in our growth as a community, but also personally. With this COVID, I can tell you that uh, I miss walking through the halls and getting hugs from people. You know, uh, yeah, they just, they are a true community partner and a true uh, giver to this area. So I appreciate your time. Thank you, Raj. And I don't know if uh, we'll ever see the days of the hugs again. And uh, it's so sad. Um, but please don't feel alone um, feeling uh, sometimes left behind. When I was in the legislature, I dubbed Rutland and Bennington counties the Forgotten Kingdom. So um, I think we all sometimes feel that we're uh, left behind. And uh, hopefully people in Montpelier aren't uh, doing that on purpose. Um, at this time, I'm opening it up for any public comment. I, those are the names that I had in advance based on either the chat function or on text. Um, but anyone is welcome to offer a public comment. Does anybody wish to do so? Hearing none, uh, I want to thank everybody from um, the NMC team. Um, I think that uh, we've learned a lot from your presentation, and uh, the next few weeks uh, we'll continue to uh, dive in and um, do the best job that we can in trying to determine uh, fair rates. So with that, um, board members, um, we are running about um, an hour behind schedule. We did have a scheduled CON discussion at one. Um, board members, would you like to do that um, after like a two minute quick break or would you like to um, uh, postpone that for today or would you like to do it later? I'd say how about 2.30? <laughs> Just a little break to go eat lunch or something, but. <laughs> okay, that may interfere with some other schedules, but go ahead. Um, I'm flexible. I I had a two o'clock that I uh, was able to reschedule. I just told the person I would let them know what time I could talk. So I'm flexible. I just it would be helpful to. Me too. I'm flexible. I'm flexible. Okay, so 2.30 it is. That's the advantage of speaking out first, Maureen. Good okay. job. So, board, um, I'll see you all again at 2.30 and enjoy your lunch. And again, thank you, team and MSA. Kevin, I'm going to move to adjourn. Thank you, Robin. I, I always try to forget that. I'll second <laughs> it. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Enjoy your lunch.